I'd like to re uh, I'd like to open a hearing, please, on House Bill 481. And again, if anybody has discuss needs to have a discussion during the time, please take it outside as well, so we can hear. And I'd like to invite the um, prime sponsor, Representative Cushing, to come forward. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Again, for the record, I'm Representative Brent Cushing from Hampton, Rockingham District 21, and I'm here in support of House Bill 481. When I was a kid growing up in Hampton, there were a number of things that were proscribed by either rules or law, um, but they were also engaged in by a number of people. Uh, Hampton was a dry town. You couldn't buy alcohol there, although I will admit that there was some alcohol consumed at Hampton Beach. And I remember going with my grandfather in his car down to Seabrook to visit Dr. Green, the green-fronted store where he would get some alcohol, uh, a substance that was available even during prohibition of alcohol for medicinal purposes in other stores. Um, gambling was prescribed, although there was a little storefront called the Empire Laundry where you could go in, put a little money down, get your laundry ticket, and when the Boston record arrived at five o'clock with the treasury number printed on the front, if that number matched your laundry number, you'd go to the laundromat and you'd get uh, a little bit of cash back. Um, times have changed. Hampton is now a brewery town, home of Smutty Nose, and in it are the state's two highest volume performing liquor stores on I-95. And what we used to call felony bookmaking, we now call power mobile. And rather than have resources for law enforcement devoted toward tracking down what was essentially anti-social behavior, I now get rewarded for you know, supporting education by buying a Powerball ticket. Um, and again, a lot of revenue flows from Hampton from those. <coughs> One of the things that this, what this bill does is recognize that our 85-year war against cannabis has been a failure. And as someone who comes from the Criminal Justice and Public Safety Committee, I'm looking forward to the day when discussions about marijuana no longer take place in my committee, but they take place in commerce and they take place in health and human services. I understand that change sometimes is pretty difficult, but we have to acknowledge that, the, that over the past 85 years, uh, the war on cannabis has been a failure and it's time to make that change. The bill that you have before us, before you, is a comprehensive uh, proposal to uh, legalize, to commercialize and, and regulate, and to tax cannabis. And I, you know, I'm mindful that this bill is a decade in the making or more. Um, in 2014, the New Hampshire House, for the first time, passed a legalization and regulation bill. Um, this bill passed, the, for the first time this year, a bill to legalize and tax passed the Criminal Justice Committee and went to the floor of the House. It passed the House, it went to Ways and Means. For the first time, it, it did. There were a number of changes that were made from the Policy Committee to the, to the Taxation uh, Committee that I, I will go through. But uh, it's, a, it's an extensive bill that also, in many ways, grew out of the uh, a study commission that was chaired by uh, Representative Abrami, who I know opposes the legislation, but I just want to give a shout out to him for conducting a pretty thorough examination of what the concern should be as New Hampshire considers treating cannabis and marijuana in a way akin to how they treat, uh, how you treat alcohol. And many of the recommendations that were made were incorporated into this bill. I'll just give you, you know, an overview. What I think is really important is just to take a look at the purpose and findings of, of, of this legislation because it sets the tone for what we're trying to accommodate. You know, it recognizes that it's the interest of a lot of law enforcement to focus on violent property crimes by, um, and, and to generate revenues for education, prevention, treatment, and recovery related use of both legal and illegal drugs, and advancing principles in, of individual liberty. That's what it is at the, at the, at the heart of this. Um, in the interest of health and safety, it, it, it would still mean that this would be focused on adult recreational use. Uh, individuals will still have to be over 21 years of age before pur purchasing cannabis, selling, distributing, and transferring cannabis to minors, 
and other individuals will remain illegal. Driving under the influence of cannabis will remain illegal. Importantly, legitimate tax-paying business people and not criminal actors will conduct the sales of cannabis. And cannabis sold in the state will be tested, labeled, subject to additional regulation to ensure consumers are informed and protected. And then some of the revenues will be used for support programs for education, prevention, treatment, and recovery related to both illegal and illegal use of drugs. What this does is it sets up the regulation of cannabis, it sets up a cannabis control commission that would be a model akin to the regulatory agencies we have for the lottery and for the liquor commission. It would have three commissioners in it. The, the, the state would delegate to the <coughs> cannabis control commission the responsibility for, to, to do a number of things. One, it would be responsible for the issuing of licenses. It, it contemplates five licenses, one for the cultivation of cannabis, one for the, for the production of cannabis by that making cannabis products, one for retail sales, um, one for transportation, and finally one for testing. One of the things that, we, that, we, that, will, that, will, that will happen and will distinguish from what goes on now is that consumers will be protected. That, that regulation for set, establishing regulations that require testing will be very important. The, perfect, the committee will have the authority to establish rules through RSA 541 that will go through a rulemaking process like other agencies do, wherein there will be opportunity for uh, you know, for members of the public, for stakeholders, to give input into what the rules and regulations will look like under which we will have legalized uh, adult recreational use of, of cannabis. And that, of course, will come back to the legislature through gel, through, through, through gel car. Um, it will have an, in, in a licensing function. A licensing function. It will. It partners with local communities. This legislation gives local communities the opportunity to, to regulate, to, to opt, you know, or to prohibit cannabis operations in their communities, or, or, or you know, set established zones. And so be it a, a growing operation or be a, a, a retail operation, they'll be subject to, uh, to governance from local authorities and also from the state. It will have a uh, process by which the commission will uh, engage in, in, will adopt rules that will provide for a means for licensing of these facilities. When a facility, an, a, an entity wishes to engage in commerce, it will make an application to the Cannabis C Control Commission. And at the same time, it will also make an application, or it will be it will be sent to the local communities. So there will be a partnership between the state and the communities in oversight and regulation of the, um, of the enterprise. We will also have an enforcement provision. We'll have the ability to establish rules for violations of the, of the laws, violations of the regulations that are set up, akin to the enforcement uh, mechanism that's used by the, the Liquor Commission to enforce the liquor licenses. And it will provide for, you know, it'll, it, it, it'll have penalties for um, those activities. And it will have strict regulations concerning what, uh, you know, concerning advertisement, concerning what those products are. It's really clear, explicit in here that you will not be able to, you know, target children, that there will be, uh, you won't be able to, to sell uh, products that are designed to uh, appeal to children. Um, it also will continue as it is now to be illegal to drive under the influence of any drug. Um, it will prohibit the consumption of <coughs> cannabis in automobiles. Uh, it will prohibit the consumption of it in public. It will extend protections to landlords um, for tenants uh, on their property, for tenants on their property, what they do. It maintains the current system and allows it to be parallel the current system of alternative treatment centers of the therapeutic use of cannabis. We recognize that we've had a pretty successful program in place for five years now that's working. We want to keep that in place. At the same time, we establish a new parallel recreational market. But the rules will make sure that should it happen that uh, 
the, the incumbent facilities that are providing a product through the therapeutic cannabis pro program, should there be an entry into the, into the market that there not be a cannibalization, if you will, of the current therapeutic cannabis program, that there'll be no diversion from product away from the needs of current patients to satisfy whatever demand there might be for recreational cannabis. Um, it allows for, you know, this bill will uh, allow, again, for the comprehensive testing and labeling. This is a way, one of the concerns that people, that we recognize when, we, when it operates, uh, you know, essentially as a criminal activity, there's no, there's no, it, it, it's, there's no control over what the quality is or what the contents are. It will require strict regulation as to the potency of the, uh, the product um, so that people will be able to make informed decisions about it and clearly label as to what goes, in, as to what takes place. Um, it also provides for a revenue stream. Uh, first of all, the concerns were that this be a program that was sufficient enough to, uh, to pay for itself, uh, realizing that, that we may have, we look back, we try to learn some lessons from what happened 85 years ago when we made a transition from being legal, uh, illegal use of <coughs> intoxicating spirits, uh, uh, illegal use of possession of alcohol to legalization of it. So too, we make it a similar, um, we, we've learned some lessons. So apart from the commercialization, this will provide 60 days after the effective date of this law that it will no longer be a criminal act for someone to have, uh, it would be legal for any individual to have personal use of cannabis. It will limit the number of plants that one can grow. Uh, it allows for, you know, for possession and for home cultivation. Um, akin to what it's like when we went from alcohol prohibition to, to legalization of regulation where, you know, you could brew some, you know, Brew some hooch in your in your basement or in your backyard or whatever the term you would use. As long as you didn't engage in commerce, we were just this is the live free or die state. We just let people alone in their own homes, and that's recognizing that apart from the commercialization aspects of it, this is just going to be a, a matter of liberty, if you will, of just letting people make decisions about what they would do in, in, in their own homes. When we go to the commercialization and we enter into commerce. <coughs> As I said, we have those five different licensing, and we also have a, a, a revenue mechanism that was devised, that was devised. The original, the bill is that originally came to, is originally came to uh, criminal justice, had a, a, an excise tax that went to ways and means, and they took a look at the, the, the tax and regulation structure, and I, I will, uh, Representative Dick Ames uh, did chair the subcommittee of that, it came up in a bipartisan fashion with what was uh, a subcommittee recommendation concerning kind of the oversight, the, the legal oversight and the taxation component. And what they recommended and what the House ultimately um, adopted was a taxation scheme that was an, a, an effective 14% tax. It was a 5% tax at the wholesale level from the, from the cultivator or the grower and then another 9% uh, tax on the at the point of commercial retail sales. Um, as we, you know, we're in a situation where, uh, you know, 20% of the country lives in states where there already is a, an active uh, adult recreational use program in place. Um, and one of the one of the things that we wanted to do in criminal justice, and I know that the Ways and Means Committee wanted to do, is to find that sweet spot where you would make sure you could pay for the program to pay for itself, but also drive up the black market. Um, it's been the experience in some other states where, well, there, as you make the transition, some of the, uh, some, I would say quite frankly, some of the taxation was a little bit too, what might be considered too high. I think Colorado is effectively 32%. It's generated a lot of revenue, but it doesn't, it has not had the, it has not as quickly as one might have hoped gotten rid of the black market. 
So in fashioning this, I know that both criminal justice and the, the co-sponsors of the bill, as well as the Ways and Means Committee, thought that uh, an effective 14% uh, tax would place us well below what is what I would will be in place in our neighboring states and in other jurisdictions where this where they move to legalization uh, regulation. Uh, there was a decision that, in terms of allocations of the of the revenue, that after the program pays for itself. Well, first of all, as the, the funds that are generated um, by the licensing process, hopefully, would be sufficient to, or, or be an approximation of what would be necessary to under to cover the uh, operating expenses of the regulatory process. Um, and also the funds of the license would go to the local communities. But to the extent that there, that there is there are revenues, it was really important um, for us to um, come up with a, a, a way to try to provide revenues to deal with some of the, you know, some of the downsides, if you will, of, uh, of cannabis or some of the concerns that were raised. So this, in the form, it, it recommends, it goes through the regular budget process, that approximately a third of the revenue will go toward uh, the Department of Health, to Health and Human Services, to Department of Safety, uh, to programs that deal with one gathering some baseline information and monitoring the ongoing information so that we understand what the impact are of the program in terms of, of public health. That it be that monies be dedicated toward toward public health um, and to substance misuse disorders across the board, be it alcohol, be it cannabis, you know, should it be cannabis, should it be anything, that money go to law enforcement because quite frankly we recognize that there's a dearth of, uh, of training, if you will, that's out there to help law enforcement deal with any of, with, particularly in the area of operation under the, under the influence. So we, approximately a third of the revenues are dedicated to that. Um, another third of the revenues are dedicated to local communities. Um, one of the things that I think we all realize is that we have, many of our communities are feeling the heat from property, from property tax. We thought if we are going to establish a new uh, program in the state of New Hampshire at the outset, we want to make sure that the municipalities will benefit from it. So it will designate a third of the revenues going to the cities and towns um, and will provide that the legislature or the th through recommendations can make a decision about how that allocation will take place, be it a combination of a per capita, uh, you know, distribution, or, per, or it, there may also be times where there'll be a need to recognize that a host community may incur some additional infrastructure costs or benefits. You may want to create a, a, a different sharing formula. What's important to remember, though, is that this will go through, it's designed to go through the legislative process. So this will become a budget item in the operating budget like every other operating budget. So the legislature will be the one that will make the determination of how these revenues are allocated to towns, as well as the remaining third will go to the general fund so that the legislature can make the decisions like anything else about where this revenue source will come, just the way we do with revenue from liquor, or sweeps, um, and, you know, et cetera. Um, that's a, kind of the, that's a, a, the broad overview of the legislation, and um, I would entertain any questions. I think it's, uh, I think it's a really good bill that fits New Hampshire. I think, again, as I've mentioned, times are changing. We are surrounded by states and jurisdictions where cannabis is legal for health, recreational use, and where commercialization is on the cusp. Uh, I think we, uh, we would do well to adopt this law as a particularly, as New Hampshire's way of making that transition from prohibition to legalization, commercialization. Thank you for your very comprehensive introduction. Senator Levitt. Oh, Senator <laughs> Chandley. <laughs> hey. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. I was looking at you. Thank you. And thank you for um, just the
presentation introduction. Um, I do see that uh, included in the legislation is provision for municipalities to um, prohibit or limit yeah. uh, uh, facilities from being in operation. I have two questions regarding that. The first is that would not allow municipalities or uh, municipalities to, and, and that's page 13, line 30. Would that, am I reading that correctly to understand that that just would, that would not allow a municipality to make illegal the consumption of cannabis, only uh, the facility? It would be, it would, it would, it would, adult use would be, this would just uh, regulate the ability of a community to regulate the sale. It's again, it's, it's kind of like when I was telling my growing up in Hampton, Hampton Beach was dry, there still was alcohol that was consumed in the town of They just couldn't sell it. And my follow-up to that is, and I, I think I understood you to be saying that um, some of the proceeds from uh, taxation would go to municipalities through some revenue sharing. Am I understanding that whether or not those municipalities that opt out of having facilities or prohibit facilities from being in their town, determination of whether revenues would go to them would be decided somewhere else? No, I mean, actually, there's two things. One, if, if the town does opt to have, uh, you know, commercial operations, the process of applying for that and the operation, there will, there's local money that will be, that will go to the town for that. Um, in terms of that allocation of the broad revenue that would come from that to the state, no, the, the town would not lose that revenue. There would be, there, there may be, this provides for uh, the, the possibility that a, that the Cannabis Control Commission could look upon a community as having, a, you know, make, a community make a case that there's a burden that's imposed or you know, that there's infrastructure cost or whatever that a community that is a host to a commercial operation would uh, incur and therefore there would be a, a, a bit of a sweetener. In that. And I, I, you know, I think we're getting, we're obviously getting back to the allocation of the meals and rooms taxes, where although now that you don't have to have restaurants or hotels in your community, you still get to have a, a share of the revenues generated, you know, from that statewide that's distributed statewide. I do know that sometimes there are some communities which would advocate for another mechanism whereby, say, you're in a coastal resort community that went from $15,000 to $100,000 to population um, for three months of the year and need to ramp up the police costs and the sewer costs, if, that there'd be a way that, you could, that the town could be reimbursed for some of the infrastructure costs. But that's not, you know, that, that would be a matter of discretion that the legislature would take up. But it does recommend 33% will go to the municipalities. Senator French, I'm afraid I have to go uh, and, and introduce the bill. I will be right back. But this is the to uh, Senator French. Thank you. Right today. Just a couple of questions. I mean, just this is quite a body of rules, regulations. I mean, it's pretty thorough, it seems. At what point did our government start regulating? marijuana or cannabis in the first place? 1935. 1935. So up until 1935, there was no regulations whatsoever on the growth of manufactured use of marijuana? I, I'm not certain I believe that's how it came about. And that was, you know, and again, this is in response to kind of a national effort. I think what happened is with the end of prohibition of alcohol in 1932, 1933, uh, there was a period of time when there was a lot of transition and for reasons that I think have deep historical racist roots, cannabis, marijuana became a reefer madness drug that was demonized and prohibited um, and that has been part, we've had that prohibition for 30, for, you know, since 1935. And, uh, so. Is there any other plant in the world 
natural plant in the world that will have this many regulations attached to it if we pass this? Um, there may be. I'm not sure. Um, so flowers? I, I would think, yeah, maybe poppies. Poppies. I mean, I think that there are, you know, I think that there are. Do you have poppies in this country? In this country in I, I don't know. I mean, I, again, I'm respected. Senator, I, I realize that we, you know, we have n numerous regulations. We have a product that has been proscribed, prohibited from use, we, that has been criminalized and continues to be criminalized for, 80, for, you know, for 85 years. And I think that, it's, that, it's, that the prohibition has just turned out to be a failure, just as we figured out prohibition of alcohol was a failure. It's the only people who seem to be benefit benefiting from this are the out, are outlaws. Uh, I also am not unmindful that it's not easy to go from prohibition to legalization uh, and commercialization. They're two different things. And, and this, this may be a pretty comprehensive piece of legislation. I think by necessity it has to be a, a pretty comprehensive piece of legislation. We have tried and listened to concerns that people have and have tried to meet those in the, in the development of this document. And it's a living document. It will be, even after we pass this and after it's commercialized and, and, and legalized, I'm sure we'll be having ongoing public policy discussions as we tweak it. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. I uh, understand your point about the prohibition, and, um, thinking back to when prohibition was put into place and was then reversed. Um, but I do have some concerns and questions. Uh, first of all, the commission uh, seems like they have a lot of work that they're going to be doing. Yes. And what are you imagining to be a timeline for this implementation? Well, this, the statutes require, first of all, I thank you for your question. I, I do want to say that one important component I, I, I left out uh, was it will also have an advisory committee that will go with it. It's intended to operate for five years. It includes uh, a, a number of stakeholders in the, a number of stakeholders who will be part and help inform and make suggestions to the members. This uh, anticipates if it passes that uh, it would go into effect that uh, the governor would make the appointments to the Cannabis Control Commission, that they would hit the ground running and open up an office and begin an extensive rulemaking process. Uh, you know, the target date to begin uh, issuing uh, licenses for cultivation would be next spring, and for commercial and retail sales, the spring of 20, 2020, uh, spring, and the retail sales would be in the fall of 2020, I think September 1st, and then, uh, I mean, the retail licensing would, would take place, and then uh, stores would operate, retail sales could, could commence in December of 2020. <coughs> okay. so year, year yes. Yeah. You know, I, would, I also know that it does provide that, that uh, what also will take place is that I think 60 days after the effective date of the statute, the, there will be the end of the criminalization of an individual, you know, possessing or having in his or her possession of yeah. So it will be akin to what the situation now is in Maine. Um, and as far as uh, edibles, mm -hmm. what is the strategy on edibles? That they, that they're part of the license, that they would be part of the licensing, or that the commission has the, um, it's, for, for instance, like they, uh, all cannabis products sold by retail stores shall include a warning label that provides caution when eaten or swallowed, the intoxicating effect of this product may be delayed up to two hours uh, unless the department, unless they determine that a different time frame would be there. It would be a disclosure on um, ingredients and possible allergens, a uh, nutritional fact panel. It would provide for opaque child resistant packaging, which shall be designed and constructed to be significantly difficult 
for children to open, and but not difficult for normal adults. Um, and you know, warning: this will have intoxicating. Uh, uh, it will have uh, intoxicating effects. How does legalizing marijuana in New Hampshire square with our federal laws where, there, where it's still legal? Uh, that's a great question. Um, well, as you, as you may be aware, as the states moved toward, uh, a number of states moved toward legalization of, of adult uh, recreational use, the federal government under the uh, Obama administration issued a, what was called a coal memo, and it laid out um, the, the scheme by which the notwithstanding the fact that cannabis and marijuana is still illegal under Schedule One of the Federal Controlled Drug Act, it would recognize that uh, that states uh, within their jurisdiction that, this, that the federal government would not prioritize, would not <coughs> interfere with states, um, provided that the legal framework that they have established. Are, was pretty strict. And that, so for instance, a, a strict tracking system. One of the things that this will require is that there be a mechanism where it's uh, seedling to sale that all cannabis be tracked from the very beginning to where, to the point of sale, so that fund, so that cannabis does not get diverted uh, other than through the established uh, stream of commerce. There'll be no interstate sales. There'll be no, again, no sales to, to no targeting for children. Um, no engaging in any other illegal activities. I mean, our, uh, this statute will, will, will provide, for instance, you will not be able to open up a store that sells alcohol and cannabis. Uh, it's just it strictly regulates the extent by which this product will be uh, accessible. Um, and another question that often gets asked is what do you do about, uh, you know, findings about this is in many ways a cash business because it's currently uh, not able to, you know, because it's going to the federal government, restrictions against how it enters into commerce. Um, this is one of the concerns that people have. I know in the federal Congress there is movement, there's legislation before how the, the, the Congress, you know, the Banking and Commerce Committee, the U.S. House of Representatives, that will allow that will allow for that. I, I would say that in no jurisdictions that have enacted a system of legalization, regulation, and taxation has the federal government taken steps to interfere with that. I anticipate that that would continue to be. I know there's a lot of efforts in Congress to make that change. Um, sometimes states are the laboratory of democracy. And the federal government's looking at what, what's happening in these laboratories of democracy and is willing to, uh, to, to step aside, provided that we don't impinge upon what takes place in other states. The state the federal government is, is, seems to be content to let the states do what they will under the, both the coal memo and even under the Sessions memo. Um, although that was a little bit more strict, it still maintains the, the policy of the federal government to allow the states to to do what they will um, in, in, in those circumstances. One other thing I should point out um, that, that was really the work of the House Ways and Means Committee is in addition to, um, to dealing with the, 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 the tax aspect of it, is that it, what it provided uh, a, uh, you know, provided for the material that's necessary to, to provide the language that will allow the cannabis industry to operate as any other business would in, in the state of New Hampshire, which means it specifically allows for the business expenditures that are occurred um, in, in a legal uh, entity in the state to enjoy the deductions that uh, one can through the business profits tax and the business enterprise tax. That's a little different than how uh, the federal government treats that because the federal government still does not recognize the cannabis-related enterprises as being legitimate, as, as being a, a normal business. It means that a business cannot deduct from their federal income taxes the expenses. We took the step of making sure that we want to encourage the development of a healthy 
sound uh, legal cannabis business in the state, so we specifically put it under the, you know, made it subject to the, to DIA regulations, <coughs> subject to the rules concerning, you know, business deductions and business expenses. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to mention that um, Representative Christian did an excellent job in presenting the uh, content of the bill. I mean, we have uh, at least 40 people signed up to testify in addition to Representative Cushing. So I will call next um, Senator Guida. I'm going to ask that I will ask that most of you that if you, that you try to contain your testimony to. Um, that which has not been already stated. So, welcome, Senator Guyton. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members of the committee, for the record, Bob Guyton, State Senator, District 2, <clears throat> speaking in opposition to this bill. I would also note for the record that we do have some out of state uh, people who have traveled here to testify, the clinical <coughs> and societal uh, PhDs, MDs, and so forth, that will probably speak up for maybe more than four or five minutes. But that is information I think is important. As you know, uh, I delivered to each of your offices three documents several weeks ago. Uh, the book by Alex Berenson, Tell Your Children About Marijuana, Mental Illness, and Violence, and the latest reports from the Rocky Mountain High Intensity Drug Area uh, Task Force that is tasked with analyzing the effects of the legalization of marijuana in Colorado. In the words of Dr. Martin Luther King, it's never the wrong time to do the right thing. Marijuana legalization is not right for our state for any number of reasons. The, the devastation that it is causing in Colorado, parenthetically, I visited Colorado about three weeks ago uh, and took a day with the head investigator for the narcotics investigators of the state of Colorado. Uh, spent probably two hours with him, visited downtown Denver, the 16th Street Mall, which used to be a wonderful place for commerce, is now a third world country. It is stacked with people sleeping, laying around, panhandling, and a cloud of marijuana smoke that covers the entire mall. Picture Manchester and Nashville, because that's what it is. My representative has introduced a bill and talks about what the bill will do. I'd like to share with you some statistics and some data on what the bill has done after five years of legalization in Colorado. 70% of the towns in Colorado have outlawed its sales in their town. I wonder why. The emergency room admissions are up a staggering. Let me make sure I get these right. All right. Since recreational marijuana was introduced, marijuana-related traffic deaths increased 151% in five years. Marijuana-related. Overall traffic deaths increased 35%. Colorado's past month usage among ages 12 and older is now third in the nation and 85% higher than the national average. This is children. I don't care what your law says, there's an element of naivete in this bill, which we used to call blue sky. On terms of revenues, Colorado is getting nine tenths of 1% of its gross revenues from the sale of Colorado. No mention of the backside costs, only the front side revenues. The yearly rate of marijuana-related hospitalizations increased 148% after legalization. And marijuana-only exposures tripled in the five years since it was legalized. The marijuana today is not the marijuana of my youth. It is roughly 60 times more potent than the marijuana that was cultivated back in the 1960s. And for that reason, it is becoming a danger. According to the Colorado Association of Chiefs of Police, Homelessness has increased by 12.2%, with 30% of the homeless admitting they came to Colorado just to get some drugs, and for marijuana explicitly. A 35% increase in emergency room visits, hospitalizations are up 70% since legalization, 42% of fatal crashes tested positive for drugs, among them marijuana. Let's talk for a minute about what this bill is really about. We have decriminalized marijuana in our state. Nobody's getting arrested. Nobody's getting prosecuted. Nobody's going to jail. We have enabled the establishment of a medical marijuana product in our state. And I supported that since 
2001, my first term, I think, in the State House. And I've supported and its expansion because medical marijuana does have a place. Albeit, many of the touted benefits don't quite measure up to the way they're being explained. But it does have a benefit. I have friends that use it, glaucoma, cancer, nausea, those types of things, it does have a place. And we have a good program in place. Legalization is really about commercialization. You think not. Remember Senate Bill 145? We heard that bill about a month ago, they do the less. And I asked the question of Dr. and Senator Sherman, I'm sorry, Senator Kahn, have you considered the fact that this bill makes it possible for private investors to go for profit in our medical marijuana dispensaries? Have you considered the fact that there are huge organizations, illegal and legal, waiting in the wings for this bill to pass so they can come in and establish a network, legal and illegal? for the sale and distribution of marijuana. I find this bill to be incredibly naive. We're going to establish five licenses. We're going to establish a law enforcement and an enforcement capability that's going to cost much more than the bill is going to bring in the revenues if Colorado and Washington and Oregon's experience is any indication. Washington State's enforcement mechanism has collapsed. They can't keep track. We're going to label things. All that's going to do when we put limits on potency is to create an even stronger black market. The black market in, Chicago, in, in Denver and in Colorado has exploded. 500 houses in, in, in Colorado have been purchased by drug cartels. And they are growing illegally in a state in which it's legal. A number of reasons for that, one of which is it costs more every time you regulate and legislate and enforce. That's an added cost that an illegal grower doesn't have to entail. The pricing structure is different. The black market is thriving. It's also thriving because it's incredibly naive to think that young people are going to stick with what we give them. I drank illegally as a young man. We went down to the beaver pond for beer or whatever, and that was fine. But we knew it was in that beer, it was bottled. We don't know what's in the stuff these people are going to be buying from the black market because there's always, amongst those who are prone to addiction, another crisis with which we're already dealing, there's always the desire to seek a better high. That's just the nature of it. We'd be incredibly naive to think that regulating and legislating and putting laws and packaging and so forth is going to have any effect on moderating the behaviors of our young people. Will not happen. Federal law, no matter what might be or could be or memos, it is illegal. If you buy marijuana and you are, uh, you are putting at risk your Second Amendment rights, background check, you're putting at risk federal jobs, which many of which require, in a state in which we're doing everything we can, we're spending millions and offering tax credits worth millions, to bring in high-tech businesses, many if not most of which, have contracts with the Defense Department or other fields of endeavor which require top secret clearances. Smoke, no clearance, it's over. So we're working against ourselves as, as a legislative body, trying to do something that's going to do Im immeasurable harm to our kids, to our businesses, to our institutions. Be incredibly naive to think that this is good for our state. As I said, 70% of the towns in Colorado have banned the sale of marijuana in their towns. And hopefully we'll be able to bring in some witnesses in the future, if this is recessed, as I think may be the intent, who have dealt with this. We have some clinicians here today that I'm going to introduce, and I'll conclude my testimony shortly. Um, we have <coughs> Bishop Jethro James. Who's Jethro James? Well, Jethro James is the pastor of the Paradise Baptist Church in Newark, New Jersey. President of the Newark and North Jersey Committee of Black Churchmen. He's also a member of several civic and fraternal organizations and is very active in the community, serving as a chaplain for the Newark Police and the New Jersey State Police Departments. He's been appointed by the Supreme Court of the State of New Jersey to serve as a member of the Attorney Legal Ethics Committee. He, along with African American legislators, religious and civic leaders, citing harm to their communities, pressured the New Jersey legislature to cancel its vote on marijuana legalization last month. The inner cities and the cities are targets of opportunity for the commercial interests waiting to harness perspective 
addicts. And this marijuana is addictive, as, as, as subsequent testimony will show. Dr. Christine Miller obtained her Bachelor of Science in Biology from MIT and her PhD in Pharmacology from the University of Colorado Health Sciences Center. For over 25 years, she's researched the molecular neuroscience of schizophrenia, 10 of those years at John Hopkins University in Baltimore. She is semi-retired, conducts occasional consulting on medical cases, and is an active volunteer for SAM Maryland. Luke Nifarado's Chief of Staff for Smart Approaches to Marijuana, SAM, spent his career working in the nonprofit healthcare uh, community. Living in Colorado during its, during its legalization, he saw firsthand the disaster effects of marijuana policies. It inspired him to work and speak across the United States for a marijuana policy free of commercialization. Remember, the underlying thing here, it's not illegal any longer to possess marijuana or to smoke it. We have to decriminalize it. We have medical marijuana. The commercialization is the underlying reason for this. And huge interests, both legal and illegitimate, are waiting in the woes for us to pass this bill so they can then come in. Remember Senate Bill 145. Dr. Catherine Antley, MD, attended the University of North Carolina Medical School, completed her residency at Duke University Medical Center in Dermopathology, serving family doctors in Vermont, New York, and New Hampshire. She's licensed to practice in our state and has done so for the past 18 years. She has co-authored all of the Vermont Medical Society resolutions opposing the legalization and commercialization of marijuana. She's provided support to families struggling with the consequences of marijuana. We don't talk about that, and we need to think about that. Mental illness, psychosis, schizophrenia. These are facts. These are not supposition. This is not blue sky. This is medical research. The reason that Mexico outlawed and India outlawed marijuana uh, decades ago is because they had come to see the psychosis and the schizophrenia that resulted from chronic use of marijuana in their populations. She has seen firsthand as an MD the devastation that this marijuana has on families, on children, on parents, on schools, on the medical profession, on the cost of medicine, on the cost of treatment. None of these things are addressed in this bill, but they will come home to roost if we legalize marijuana in our state. I thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I'm happy to answer any questions, but in the interest of time, I would prefer to let those experts who have come from afar testify. Thank you very much, Senator Guy. I appreciate that. Uh, I'd like to call Representative Patrick Abrami, who chaired the uh, Marijuana Commission. Representative Abrami is still here? No. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Um, so again, I will ask people if it has been said, please do not repeat what has been said, but we're interested in hearing from each person. Um, I will invite uh, <coughs> Jean Hruska from the ACLU, please. from specifically a criminal justice reform perspective. Um, I don't take a position on the taxation regulation piece of it. It's specifically the legalization component um, that we're here to support. Ending the failed war on cannabis is part of our civil rights priority of ending the failed war on drugs. 
the war on drugs has driven mass incarceration in recent decades and corresponding racial disparities in incarceration rates. And the war on cannabis has absolutely been a factor in that. And we often talk about mass incarceration as a national issue, but the racial disparities that we see nationally are seen here in New Hampshire as well, both in terms of incarceration and in terms of the way that cannabis laws are enforced. A couple of these are in my testimony, but I'll highlight a couple here. In 2016, the black incarceration rate in New Hampshire was five times higher than the white incarceration rate. And to be more poignant, to, to look at specifically cannabis laws, in 2010, the black population in New Hampshire was 1.2%. The black arrest rate for cannabis was 3.3%. So I want to note that what we see in New Hampshire is seen much broad, more broadly nationally, that the war on cannabis has been used to disproportionately target vulnerable communities, including communities of color. And that doesn't just mean with enforcement rates, that means that the collateral consequences of a criminal record are disproportionately experienced by those same communities. That means hardship in finding jobs, in finding housing, in accessing federal student loans, um, it has devastating consequences for years and decades to come. Uh, decriminalization in New Hampshire was definitely a step forward. It was not a panacea. We continue to see people dragged into the criminal justice system because of cannabis. Um, right now, it's a violation for, for if you have three quarters of an ounce or less. A violation is $124. I want to put that into context. Road racing, driving on a public sidewalk, gets you a $62 fine. Cannabis gets you a $124 fine. I would argue that road racing is a public concern, um, but it's fine substantially less. Um, and lastly, I'll just note that 60% of grand staters support legalization. We are, this country, New England, we are moving towards legalization. Um, and I think the work put into this bill in the House um, is a credit to this bill being as strong as it possibly could. Um, and the ACLU urges the members of this committee to support it. I think I have two seconds left. Thank you very much. I appreciate the testimony. Yeah. Any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Chair Pauls, Robert Andelman, please. Good morning, my name is Dr. Robert Andelman. I'm a retired anesthesiologist, uh, 36 uh, years in Dover in Portsmouth, mostly in Portsmouth. I'm a, a past 10-year member of the Board of Medicine, past president of the Board of Medicine, and I was on the uh, Therapeutic Cannabis Advisory Council for several years. Uh, I currently uh, volunteer several days a week at Families First in Portsmouth. I prescribe Suboxone. I work in their uh, opioid use uh, disorder program. Basically, I'm here to oppose HB 481 on the basis that it does not in any way address DUI in cannabis. Uh, we know that uh, drivers who consume or smoke uh, cannabis and drive afterwards uh, appear to be driving normally, but they're impaired in terms of uh, reacting quickly in a complex situation the proverbial child who uh, dashes out uh, onto the road in front of the car. Um, there are many studies in this country and others, but uh, the general consensus is, is that uh, driving after consuming or smoking cannabis roughly doubles the chance of an auto accident. Uh, in states that have uh, legalized cannabis, uh, crashes are up, uh, DUI arrests relating to THC are up, and fatalities uh, are up, which involve a driver testing positive for THC. Simulator tests uh, with uh, drivers in um, simulators basically uh, confirm this. They, um, they're impaired in terms of their uh, reaction times. Uh, they uh, we, uh, lean weave and uh, they can't uh, adjust quickly to a complex situation. Uh, same thing for airline pilots. Uh, in uh, cockpit simulators, uh, the interesting thing is, is that the pilots appear to be impaired for about 24 to 48 hours after a modest or moderate dose of cannabis. Um, alcohol makes it only worse. It's been said that a 0.04 blood alcohol content plus a modest dose of cannabis 
uh, doubles the uh, effect of the alcohol to about 0.08. Uh, as a uh, former anesthesiologist who's given uh, multiple uh, brain depressant drugs uh, simultaneously to one patient, my, my hunch and my uh, guess is, is that one unit of uh, cannabis impairment and one unit of alcohol impairment does not equal two units of impairment. It uh, more likely equals four or even eight, and on uh, occasion, 16 units of impairment. Um, the problem is, is that we don't have an, a breathalyzer for THC. And the uh, additional problem is, is that THC is cleared rapidly from the blood uh, after smoking a few hours. And for law enforcement who uh, arrive on the scene of an accident, it can take them two to four hours before they can get a patient and even a driver to uh, the um, uh, hospital in order to um, get a blood drop. May I wrap up in 60 seconds? Is that okay? Fine, thank you. All right, so what are we as a community and a state to do? Well, Colorado, uh, basically many states have enacted a, uh, a, a legal limit for THC in the blood. It has to be in the blood, not the urine. A chronic smoker who stops smoking can excrete uh, THC metabolic products for up to several weeks or even a month or more in the urine. So it's got to be THC in the blood. Colorado set a, a rather lenient limit of five nanograms per milliliter. Other states have gone to three, two, and one. There are 11 or more states who have a zero tolerance policy. So to sum up, I oppose 481 on the basis that it has not addressed the DUI issue. I think we cannot pass this bill because of that. We've got to get it right, right ahead of time. We can't backtrack, we can't patch. Uh, we're going to miss too much. We're going to miss a lot of accidents that are related to THC, including some fatalities. My vote, zero tolerance for THC in the blood. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yes, so it's French. Thank you, Dr. for coming and testifying today. So your paper is all on DUI and driving impairment. Are there any other objections you have to the population's use of marijuana other than driving impairment? Uh, honestly, I came here today prepared only to address the DUI issue. Um, I am a member of the Medical Society, but I did not coordinate with them in order to come here today. Uh, last night, for the first time, I read their position paper uh, on um, this bill on, you know, commercialization of marijuana, I will say that I thought it was excellent, and I agree with their, their statements. Which were? Well, basically, they, uh, well, it's, it's a rather long and complex statement, and I'm not really prepared to address the whole thing. For me. I'm sorry? Could you summarize it in 27 minutes for me? <laughs> <laughs> um, they, they oppose this bill. They oppose, they, they oppose it on global concerns. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Next, I'd like to call Susan O'Brien, please. My concern today, however, 
something I can't find out, is about the confidentiality also of records that go to a state when applying for a card. I don't know who these people are. I don't know what their qualifications are for denying sick people help. And I don't know why a doctor cannot have her word or his word taken for someone who's ill. I have heard the argument about dangerous driving. Well, my grandfather was killed by a drunk driver when my father was nine years old. This still reverberates down through the generations. So by that logic, we should be outlawing alcohol if we're really concerned about substance driving. So finally, I just hope that none of you here have people in your family or your friends who are suffering who cannot take advantage of this. I understand it's not proven for pain relief, but a year ago I wouldn't have believed how few options there are. And I think that we should have the opportunity to try it, especially when my doctor was super busy. So I'm asking you to please move this bill forward. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much for your testimony. I'd like to call uh, Bishop Jeffrey James, please. Let me say good morning to this committee. Thank you. I'm Bishop Jeffrey James from York, New Jersey. I'm uh, several things. Chaplain, though, for the uh, New Jersey State Police uh, did the triage on 9 11. Ground Zero survived the cancer. I have been the advisor to the last six governors of the state of New Jersey, the last 20 uh, attorney generals to the state of New Jersey on matters and um, was successful in taking on the governor that I helped elect that they pulled the bill a week ago. How did we do it? Well, the first thing that we pointed out, it'll be devastating to communities of color. I heard the ACLU talk about um, the disproportion. African Americans in the state of New Jersey are 70% of the population, yet instead we're 62% of the prison population, but most of them are not there for marijuana. So that's a misnomer. Um, the reality is on Wednesday, this week, we asked our governor to pardon anybody who wants to let out. So that whole social justice piece is not really what this is about. This is about greed and money. Um, the reason they pulled the bill, we have a lot of urban areas, which is not the case in New Hampshire. However, um, if anybody watches the housewives of New Jersey, they live in Bergen County very wealthy um, county, one of the wealthiest in the nation. And um, one of the children from Bergen County was able to get their hands on some edibles at the school. And they wound up at the hospital in Ridgewood, New Jersey, where to buy a cake you need a half a million dollars. And so that's made communities, non-colored communities, start looking at the bill saying, wait a minute, if this edibles can get, I heard, um, things in your bill like um, child-proof um, locks. I'm 69 years old. I want to get something open, I give it to my grandchildren. They can open anything. There is no such thing as child-proof locks. Um, what we're seeing um, in New Jersey, um, we're seeing, and, and by the way, I'm also a retiree of PSEG, um, one of the, the largest utility company, uh, one of the largest ten in the nation. Um, there's mandatory testing as a condition of employment. The last thing that you want is a crane operator, a pilot, or someone, your UPS <laughs> driver or anyone else, um, high off of marijuana. It will preclude um, folks from getting into the workforce. Um, what we understand in this country, and I believe New Hampshire is one of the states, whenever a child is born, the mother is tested for any drugs in her system. In the state of New Jersey, it automatically um, goes to the Division of Youth and Family Services 
and you now have an open case. If you work in law enforcement or some other job, or work with children, your boss has to be notified because you've now tested positive for drugs. And part of the adjudication process is that you're monitored for a few weeks to make sure that your marijuana use will not impede you from taking care of your children. And so it's not an overnight thing. Public housing, I don't know how much public housing you have in New Hampshire, but because public housing is federal, it's an automatic eviction if you smoke in public housing. We looked at um, some of the things. The insurance rate in New Jersey is one of the places where we have the highest insurance in the nation, depending on who you want to fight with, one or two, us in New York. And the reality is what we found out in New Jersey. I met with some of the insurance carriers at the thousand foot level. They're saying if they pass legalization that they want 20% across the board and in the municipalities that opt in, they want more. They'll probably get 10% from the commission, but that's a cost, a societal benefit for those that don't want marijuana. Then we looked at um, causes of things that would happen. We're seeing, especially in dilapidated housing, we're seeing investors coming in and really forecasting that we're going to get an opportunity to be marijuana growers. What does that mean? Um, well, you'll get the place back on your tax rolls for the municipality, but they really don't want to rent it. In New Jersey, um, TRA, Temporary Rental um, Assistance, can be up to $1,500, and so per family. But if you turn it into a marijuana grow house, you can get eight to fifteen thousand dollars from the plants, and so they don't want to give public housing or market rate housing to anyone. And then we take a look at what the black market is doing. The black market is in competition. As you know, what was proposed um, by our governor um, was a forty-two dollar uh, per ounce on recreation marijuana, that's a big fight going on, but it isn't happening. It allows the black market to say, guess what, I have the same problem for less money. And then we talked about the THC levels. Um, the reality is that our children, we're telling them not to smoke cigarettes. We're telling them not to smoke, secondhand smoke is bad. The New England Journal of Medicine put out a report last year that said smoking THC you'll probably have your first heart attack before you're 35. The hookah, the, the, the uh, electronic cigarettes, they sell in Denver a package with a syringe in it. It is 72% pure THC, where our children shoot it into what they smoke. And of course, um, they have a problem. I don't want to get into the whole medical piece. Um, public housing, food stamps. If you're a recipient of food stamps because it's a federal um, indication, a federal benefit, if you're caught smoking marijuana in a legal state and your caseworker gets wind of it because it's federal dollars, your food stamps are sanctioned for five months in the state of New Jersey. And so when, then there's looping. What is looping, Bishop? I'm glad you asked me. Looping says I go to your legal spot, I buy my whatever the legal allotment is, one ounce in the case of Colorado for the day. I go take my glasses off, I go in, they don't recognize me. And just like a loop and a videotape, I go in, I buy another ounce. The next time I go in, within the hour, I take off my jacket. They don't recognize me without my jacket and my glasses. I get another ounce. And so there's a company called Sweet Leaf in Colorado. It's the first time that the federal government has actually brought a case and won a case against major marijuana growers because of looping. And then um, what we're finding out, and um, by the way, I guess I'm real proud of it because Whoopi Goldberg called me out on her show um, for not allowing this to pass. Um, when you start dealing with the oils, when you start dealing with what they're suggesting um, women to take, um, for um, their menstrual cycles or in their first 
trimester as um, a, a, a pregnancy, we found out that the THC, depending on the level, will definitely remain in the mother's breast milk. And they're seeing schizophrenic babies. And so, as I, I, I close this, um, former Attorney General uh, in the state of New Jersey, now works for a very prestigious law firm, spoke to me this week and said, we're going to make a ton of money setting up these corporations. He said, and after they make their billions, five years from now, we're going to make a ton of money because of the lawsuits, because if a doctor misdiagnoses a child and it's found that the mother, because of what has been done through legislation, through these companies, um, there's going to be lawsuits, and you're going to pay those billions out to take care of these children. I chaired the Human Service Advisory Council of Essex County in New Jersey, 22 municipalities, Newark being the largest um, city in the state. I talked to Dr. Scapelli um, about what would it cost for a child with behavior, disabilities, or disorders as a result of THC. He said, depending on how mild the disorder, figure a million dollars a year for those children. This bill is really a farce. This bill, as they tried to do in New Jersey, said we'll fix it on the back end. There's no fixing the back end of a brain. There's no fixing um, folks that are homeless. There is no fixing people of color who will still be locked up. And there's no fixing because their marijuana did not discriminate. It went to the richest county in the state of New Jersey and found that it also poisoned those children. And because of that, would a Democratic governor, a Democratic legislator, both houses, they were not able to muster the votes because the facts speak for themselves. And lastly, when you think of setting up a commission, if you do so, why would you put someone or the majority of the commission who is in the cannabis business, why don't you put the fox and just let him watch the hen house? Thank you so much. Thank you, Bishop. Uh, I'd like to call Chief John Fosky, please. Good morning, members of the committee, and my name is John Bacossi. I am the Chief of Police in Bedford, New Hampshire, and I'm here representing the New Hampshire Chiefs of Police Association, who are adamantly and vehemently opposed to this particular bill. Uh, this debate is about public harm and public safety from our point of view, um, and you entrust us each and every day, each and every Chief of Police in the state of New Hampshire, this great grand state that we have, with the public safety of all the residents, including yourselves. And yet, we are opposed to this bill because of the potential public harm that it will uh, create uh, and impose upon the residents of the state of New Hampshire. This is about the debate to legalize and promote uh, the addition of another intoxicant to the list of legal intoxicants that we now face uh, and struggle with in a state that struggles with a high rate of addiction to both alcohol as well as opiates. Any argument that uh, compares uh, alcohol to marijuana or THC more specifically uh, is vacuous, it is disingenuous, and it's simply not true. The references to prohibition in 85-year-old information and media accounts about marijuana is ignoring the science and facts that we have before us today. I ask you to pay attention to the National Academy of Medicine and their reports. I ask you to pay attention to the data and science produced by the CDC. I ask you to pay particular attention to the 2018 American Journal of Psychiatry report that shows that people who habitually use marijuana are three times more likely to move on to opiates. Opiates in the state of New Hampshire where we kill off the equivalent of this esteemed body every year for the last four years. 
three times more likely to move on to opiates. We already have decriminalization. We are not stigmatizing folks for small quantities and user quantities of marijuana. But yet we are still sending a message by showing that it's a violation, that it's not the proper thing to do, that it is not approved for societal and recreational use. And I agree with um, the ACLU who said that road raising is, in fact, um, more dangerous than marijuana. So I would urge the legislature to increase the fine for road raising <laughs> and not reduce the fine for the use of marijuana. The habitual use of marijuana has shown to increase aggressive episodes by a rate of three to five times more for interpersonal violence. And of course, we know who are the victims of interpersonal violence. The information and data from the states who have legalized marijuana shows that violent crime has increased, motor vehicle accidents have increased, homelessness have, have increased substantially. The black market has not gone away. The evidence is clear from our colleagues in Oregon and Colorado, both states of which become uh, net exporters of marijuana. The black market has flourished to the point where California has introduced legislation to reduce the taxation of uh, marijuana, legal marijuana in California because they have overestimated by more than $160 million the amount of revenue that California was due to take in. Vermont is losing money. Uh, the state of Colorado uh, expects to spend $4.50 for every $1 revenue that they take in. The legalization of marijuana is driving your therapeutic cannabis programs in various states um, out of business. Uh, so we look uh, to the state of Maine, our nearest neighbor, who shows a significant and dramatic decline uh, in their therapeutic cannabis program. The cost of regulation is significant. This is not inevitable, ladies and gentlemen. Um, mar marijuana legalization is not inevitable. Um, we go our own way in the state of New Hampshire. Um, it's called the live free or die state for a reason. We are independently minded. We don't do things just because our neighbors or our friends do them. Um, and I've heard a lot of words used like expect, anticipate, uh, we believe, we suspect, we think. I ask you again, um, as a chief who has been in the business for over 40 years, 27 of those years with DEA, to pay attention to the science, pay attention to the data. Jim Kowaki. I am for cannabis legalization. And if smoking kills you and gives you heart attacks, I should have been dead years ago, but you're going to hear me today anyway. So I just want to read something really quick from the Psychiatric Times. I know we're always reverting back to what the medical industry is saying. Um, this is what the medical industry is saying about the book you've all been given, Alex Borenson. The original title of Reefer Madness was Tell Your Children. This also happens to be the name of the fiction writer and former journalist, Alex Berenson's new book. Nowhere in his book does he acknowledge his title's irony. Yet, Berenson's reference to Reefer Madness is appropriate. Like the movie, his book is ripe with hyperbolic asser assertions and biased interpretation of scientific literature. Berenson's claims that cannabis use leads to psychosis and violence he states this thesis just a few pages into the book, claiming that whether marijuana is dangerous to the brain and certainly ultimately cause violence in the scientific is a scientific question with a hard yes or no answer. We have that answer. This absurd promise is the fatal flaw of Berenson's book. To date, research has not demonstrated a simple connection, let alone a casual connection, between cannabis and violence. Little disclosure here, these physicians who support the legalization and effective regulation of cannabis based on principles of public health and social justice. We strive to follow the science, even when the science contradicts our conclusions that the harms of cannabis prohibition are far worse than the harms of cannabis use. These doctors, one of them is the former Surgeon General of the United States. Another quick thing, but most of bears Berenson's assertions are unsupported by science. For example, 
A recent study showed a decrease in domestic violence among cannabis using couples. This doesn't prove that cannabis reduces violence, but it certainly suggests that any relationship between cannabis and violence is complicated and influenced by a host of factors. Berenson's conveniently dismisses studies like that that are in conflict with his narrative. Reaction to the book has been swift. Dr. Ziva Cooper, a co-author of the 2017 National Academy of Medicine report on cannabis upon which Berenson relies, tweeted, we did not conclude that cannabis causes schizophrenia. Rand Drug Policy Research Center co-director Dr. Bo Kilmer was unequivocal in a recent tweet about Rand's interpretation of the literature from 2001 to 2011. Marijuana use does not induce violent crime. Perhaps the greatest tra tragedy of Tell Your Children has nothing to do with cannabis. Berenson's insidious associations of psychosis with violence unfairly stereotypes people living with psychosis, very few of whom ever are ever violent, evoking the bias that has long plagued this vulnerable population. Lest we be misunderstood, we're not claiming cannabis use is risk-free, but we believe the book is a distraction from a serious discussion of the other risks of cannabis use. Studies show that you shouldn't drive a car while under the influence, that underage recreational use is harmful, and that some people use cannabis problematically. However, cannabis use causes no lasting harm to most healthy, non-pregnant adults. Berenson's discussion discusses cannabis as if it were uniquely dangerous. Many foods, drugs, and activities like motorcycle riding carry a risk of injury or death to people who indulge in them. As alcohol prohibition taught us, the government, government must not lightly wield the blunt instrument of criminal justice to stop consenting adults from engaging in risky behaviors. Now this is from Dr. David L. Latham, MD, Joslyn Elders, MD, the former Surgeon General, and Byron Adenoff, and this is right out of the Psychiatric Times. April 10th, 2019. So, uh, the other thing I just wanted to make clear, we're not trying to legalize marijuana for pregnant women or children. We want money so that we can educate these people and keep it away from them. But without money, we cannot educate. Thank you for your testimony. Any more questions? Great. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to call Annika Stanley Smith, please. Thank you to the committee for this time today. My name is Annika Stanley Smith, and I am a substance, prevention, uh, substance misuse prevention coordinator for the Capital Area Public Health Network. I'm from the town of Gosstown, and I'm also submitting testimony for the New Hampshire Public Health Association. Um, so I am a certified prevention specialist, and I love hearing people talk about education around substance use disorders. Um, uh, but I would say that educating and pamphlets and things like that are not the only thing that help prevent substance use disorders. I'd just like to uh, clarify some issues that we're seeing right now currently in New Hampshire. Um, in order to understand the impact of marijuana commercialization on New Hampshire, I just want to share some quick facts. Um, currently the most used drug in New Hampshire may surprise you. Despite what you see in the news or on social media, um, the most used drug in New Hampshire is the one that people can buy at almost street, any street corner. It can be purchased in grocery stores, at gas stations, um, even at stores that are run by the state. This drug is the number one cause of substance use related deaths in New Hampshire over all other drug deaths uh, combined, uh, according to the New Hampshire Medical Examiner's Office. And uh, the drug that I'm referring to is alcohol. Um, so, a couple reasons that is the case, that alcohol is the most used substance in New Hampshire and more people die from it, more children use it than, any other, than, than most other states, is because there's so much access to it and because the social norms around it are that it's a safe thing to use. And what we're starting to see in trends data for marijuana is that youth are really starting to recognize it as a non-harmful substance, which we know that that's not true. Um, so just to address a couple uh, things that have come up and not to read from my testimony any further. Um, uh, when we talk about regulating therapeutic marijuana, I would argue that it's not well regulated. The commission um, or the group that's supposed to meet does not meet frequently. And actually there's a group here that called to attention um, a, uh, a, a therapeutic organization that was advertising to you illegally and there wasn't much done about it. 
Um, so I would say it's actually not regulated very well, but we do believe that people should have access to therapeutic marijuana. We do recognize that it does have some health benefit benefits. Um, and uh, when talking about an advisory committee that would overlook legalizing marijuana or the commercialization of marijuana, um, we're in opposition to that because it does not allow for people in opposition to marijuana legalization to sit on that. So how can I, as, I, as a prevention specialist, give you the best prevention tools if I'm not allowed to sit at that table? Um, we also don't believe in the war on drugs. We don't think anyone should go to jail for a substance use disorder. And people who chronically use marijuana do have a diagnosable disease. They have a marijuana use disorder or a cannabis use disorder. And so that needs access to treatment. What we're seeing in New Hampshire with, with, um, to, uh, with alcohol, which we have the most access to and people have the most use disorders from, is that um, we make around $153 million in the sales from alcohol. Um, but the cost of substance use disorders, and recognizing that that's all substance use disorders, not just alcohol use disorders, is around $2.6 billion. So there's no way, even with you know, having the most successful mar marijuana sales of any state, that we would ever reach the actual cost of substance use disorders or of marijuana use disorders. Um, and uh, you know, Representative Cushing and other members have mentioned that this, this bill provides for prevention, treatment, and recovery services. Um, I would say it's nowhere near what's ne necessary. And also, actually, uh, it was recently changed so that it goes to the general fund. And what we've seen with the alcohol fund, which is money that was supposed to go to prevention, treatment, and recovery, in over 10 years, that it's really only gone there once or twice, and it's never been fully funded until this year. So um, I think when we look at this bill and we talk about highly regulating it, it's not regulated enough. And the sales that we're going to get, the taxes from this, is not going to be enough to help New Hampshire out of the hole that we will be digging by allowing youth and others more access to this substance. The more access we have, the more substance use disorders we have, the more people who are sick, the less likely we are to be able to afford it. We can't afford where we're at right now. We have a 2.9% unemployment rate. We can't even fill the positions we have now because so many people are suffering from this disease. So I would implore you, please, look strongly at this bill and recognize that it is not effective for New Hampshire and that prohibition, yes, it's not effective, but neither is commercialization. You do not have to commercialize marijuana in order to have prohibition. You can still help people without commercialization. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Senator, do you have a question? Yes, thank you. Thank you for your testimony. So my question is, in your line of work, do you see people that are uh, that have a substance abuse disorder that is solely yes. like cannabis, yes, not not other drugs or alcohol? So I don't solely do one-on-one -on -one treatment, but I work in the community and I work with doctors that only are ex waiver doctors. So they only work with people with substance use disorders, and they see a number of people with marijuana use disorders. A lot of times with substance use disorder, it's not just one substance, it's usually multiple, but there are people who are diagnosed as having a cannabis or marijuana use disorder, so that means their prim primary substance of use is cannabis or marijuana. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the chair calls Margaret Dry. Good morning. For the record, I'm Margaret Dry from Plainfield, New Hampshire. I've been an EMT in New Hampshire for 40 years. And I wanted to draw the attention of the committee to uh, the Valley News from last week, uh, where a Democratic presidential candidate, uh, Marianne Williamson, participated in a discussion on the opioid crisis at Headrest, which is a long-standing Lebanon-based suicide prevention and drug treatment center. Uh, when the candidate said, that she had, it had never been in her impression that marijuana or alcohol are anywhere near the gateway to opioid addiction. Do you know what that group of people said? The entire room of treatment providers, almost in unison, according to the Valley News, said, oh yes, they are. These are the people who have boots on the ground. We need to pay attention to what they're saying. You just heard from the New Hampshire Association of Chiefs of Police. That's another agency with uh, boots on the ground. They're opposed to the bill for a number of reasons, among them being there is no roadside test or level of 
C that will hold up the court that can determine impairment. I mean, whether you agree with legalizing marijuana or not, it's obvious we need a standard. Imagine having no legal impairment limit for alcohol. The chiefs of police also uh, drew attention to the fact that marijuana is the most commonly seen illicit drug in fatal accidents. And I want to tell you that my four decades of experience in the field bear that out. At the opening of a session in Representatives Hall a couple of weeks ago, the person who was giving the invocation reminded representatives that what they vote on affects thousands and thousands of people. The people who pick up the pieces in this state are against this bill. Voting to legalize for recreational use a hallucinogenic drug that can be a gateway to opioid addiction while we're in the middle of an opioid crisis is hypocritical. Voting to legalize it without giving police the tools they need to arrest and prosecute impaired drivers is unconscionable. Please vote this bill, ITL. Thank you. Questions?
The next person I'd like to call here. Oh, okay. Dan Goodman. Thank you very much for having me. My name is Dan Goodman. I'm the Public Affairs Manager for AAA Northern New England. We're an auto public membership organization that is in Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont. We have one million members. Uh, we've been advocating for public policies to make our roads safer, a place to live, work, and raise families for a long time. And uh, we're here to, uh, I'm here to oppose this bill. Uh, we have some major traffic safety concerns about it. Uh, we think it poses a very serious threat to the safety of all New Hampshire road users. Uh, we have a foundation, it's called the AAA Foundation for Traffic Safety. In the past few years, it has released two important research projects to help understand the potential traffic safety implications of substance impaired driving. They went out to Washington State to legalize the drug in 2012, and the percentage of drivers in fatal crashes who recently used marijuana more than doubled from 8% in 2013, a year after legalization, to 17% in 2014. And recent use was defined as having a detectable amount of active THC tested after the crash, which is about four to six hours. This means that one in six Washington drivers involved in fatal crashes tested positive for active THC. The trend is extremely troubling because the proportion of fatal crashes involving marijuana in Washington had been very stable. The second part of the study was that unlike tests used today by law enforcement to measure blood alcohol content or BAC to enforce drunk driving laws, there is no similar, reliable, or scientific way to test for marijuana impairment. For example, some drivers with high active THC, THC levels may not be impaired, while others with relatively low levels may be unsafe behind the wheel. There is just no easy way to test whether a driver is impaired by marijuana. And there have been a lot of other studies that have been coming out, and I'm just going to reference one that I just saw the other day from the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety, which looked at a report looking at other states, I think it was four states, that had recently used marijuana in collision claims compared to their neighboring states were about three to eight percent higher um, than those other states. And so, and lastly, um, last year we had, and this, this statement has been talked about a few times, last year we had over 10,000 people die or killed in drunk driving related car crashes. It has taken generations to educate the public about drinking and driving and to strengthen the laws to reduce drunk and driving. Without solid measures in place to detect and prosecute for marijuana impaired driving, um, uh, gonna, we're going to oppose uh, this bill. And that is it. Are there questions? I have one quick question. Yeah. Do you have data on what the difference is between? You said that there were uh, there was an increase in number of fatal accidents and in, in the number of people who had used marijuana. Um, do you have any data on the increase of all accidents as compared to those who are using marijuana? I don't have that with me. I, I don't know the answer, but I, I can send that to you. Okay. So all, all, all users, so the percent of yes, all... Yes, so we right. can put it in perspective. Exactly. Thank you very much. Senator Vick also has a question. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you for your testimony. So in, in conjunction with uh, Senator Hanson's question, you had said that there was an increase in the years of like 2014, and there was an increase in 2013, 2013. from 8% to 2017, excuse me, 2013 to 2014, like 8% to 17%. Could you get us numbers moving forward up to 2018? Sure. It's the most recent numbers. We'll get. numbers. And for those same times, it would be great to have the numbers to compare them to how many accidents overall, maybe even how many accidents with alcohol. Okay. Thank you very much. Any other Thank questions? You. Thank you for your testimony. Um, next, I would like to call, please, Quincy Roy. Hello, my name is Quincy Roy. I'm a sophomore at Memorial High School. 
uh, that's in Manchester, New Hampshire, and he's 15 years old. So I work with a coalition called Make It Happen, and our goal is to educate peers and younger children about the safety of both proper use of prescription drugs and also avoiding the use of illicit, mind-altering illegal drugs. So the reason I'm here today is because I am an individual who I'm very close to, uh, who has experienced substance use issues. Um, in fact, this person is partly the reason why I joined my coalition in eighth grade. So I've been with my coalition for three years, and every day I would see this individual struggle. I was a middle schooler at the time, and I saw this individual first become rebellious and act out, then stay out late, party, etc. And then it started affecting his sleep, and then he became addicted to it, and the lifestyle. Then it made him very lethargic, and it caused him to never leave his bedroom. He wasn't healthy, he gave up, he didn't graduate, he dropped out. As a middle schooler, every day, I would give him words of encouragement. I was a middle schooler. To just get through one more day, one more hour, one more minute, whatever you could bear. And it takes a person 10 times harder to get back on the right track after going off. This past week, I spoke with a handful of representatives from all over New Hampshire, over the phone. I wanted to thank those who did not vote for the bill and dig deeper as to why others did. When calling this one representative up, his reasoning for passing the bill was that opioids are regulated, however, they still manage to get into the wrong hands. When er what I understood from that argument was when I broke it down, he believed that we should not only have opioids in the wrong hands, but marijuana as well, and youth. Youth are those wrong hands. And as the representative said, if opioids get there, this will as well. Another issue is the use of marijuana in New Hampshire homes will be normalized. And many parents who would never have considered the use of marijuana prior to its legalization will now feel it's okay. This puts children at risk. This mind-altering substance can lead to the neglect of children who are the most vulnerable members of our society. These young children will have literally no choice but to inhale secondhand smoke have colorful delectable treats at their fingertips or ingest a toxic amount and may later experience an impact on their growing brains and cognitive abilities. My question for our legislators is why are we allowing another substance to be legalized? A substance that will be advertised to young susceptible individuals. A substance that will much more easily be passed down from legal age individuals to minors. A substance that will physically and mentally affect a young brain. Why take advantage of their health? Anxiety and stress have be, are becoming a new, epi, a new epidemic amongst my peers. And why add one more drug that they can self-medicate with? Also, personally, I do not want my state officials, my military, my law officers, my firemen, my teachers, my doctors, my bankers, my lawyers, my bus drivers, anyone other than Oh, wait. Anyone who I individually rely on to be responsible, to be decisive, to make sensible decisions, or to be productive, to have their judgment altered. And since most effective individuals in our community do not use marijuana, I question why we are going to make this drug readily available to others, and it cannot benefit anyone. I don't understand. Other than the medical side of it that we already have passed. To those who support the legalization of marijuana, often state that it is not a gateway <coughs> drug. I have watched how marijuana led to experimentation to other much more dangerous drugs. I witnessed that, both in my personal story that I shared and amongst other acquaintances. acquaintances. I'm speaking today not only for my story, but the many thousands of youth who have been introduced to other more dangerous drugs through marijuana, and in my book, That's a Gateway. I may be young, I may only be one voice, but I'm really the voice of many, many other youth similar to myself. 
please hear us and our opinions because they matter. I don't want another youth person to have to sit back and watch the crumbling of another life in front of them, someone that they love. It results in the crumbling of those around them as well, such as myself, watching my brother, my brother go through this. Thank you. I would really like questions. <laughs> your opinion that marijuana is a gateway drug is it and I don't know if this falls in your expert purview but do you think it's the marijuana that's the gateway or the need for people to have mind altering experiences um I think that it's both because like I had stated before, um, anxiety and stress can be something that causes someone to turn to marijuana and it can start with that, but then it kind of just continues to tumble because either they're not satisfied with the high that they're getting from the marijuana or they're already struggling personally and someone offers them something more and it continues to tumble and they try new things that is going to affect them and harm them. Okay, just one more. Sure. Thank you. Uh, you. You say that you and your peers are facing a lot more difficulties in uh, uh, depression. Mm -hmm. Do you know what that's caused by in your, in, in your friends? Um, Personally, I'm not exactly sure because everyone has their own story and not everyone cares to share that. But I know that it can be many different things. For example, I think what happened to my sibling is that the divorce of two parents was one thing and then not being able to live with his mother, which was, you know, really important to him but it just couldn't happen for medical reasons that he was, his whole life was just turned upside down. And there's so many different stories that you don't know because it's their life and it's something they don't want to share, but it still affects them. And it's so many stories like that that are all different that can affect someone to want to maybe just try something to say, hey, you know, everything's going down right now, so why not try something new? Mm. And it,
do you think that we can regulate that now, where people are doing it and it's illegal? That's a hard question. I think that in some households, it's already happening that way. But to legalize a drug, it'll enable more adults to say, oh, I never thought of that. It, I never thought that it wouldn't be that bad. I never thought that it could, you know, it won't affect someone. Because by legalizing it, you're saying that it's OK to do this. And so more adults will be more apt or more likely to take the, that chance than what's going on right now. There are less people who are taking that chance. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. And um, <laughs> I'd like to call next, please, Detective Christopher Wright. Okay. Next, uh, Major John N. Kern. Good morning, members of the committee. My name is John Antanasio. <coughs> I'm a major with the New Hampshire State Police and currently in charge of the Field Operations Division. I will keep my testimony very short because the majority of my points have already been made. Uh, there's been some excellent testimony here today, and I would let the committee know that the Department of Safety and the New Hampshire State Police oppose this bill, as we have in the past, and we continue to do so for a number of reasons. Uh, Several that have been mentioned, the issue of drug driving and roadside chemical testing uh, presents a giant challenge to the state police as well as all of law enforcement at this time. <coughs> the potency of uh, the marijuana that we're seeing now is much different than what we've seen in the past, and it makes uh, the dangers of marijuana that much more real. The risk perception of youth, what kind of message are we sending to our children uh, if we're going to legalize another substance? Again, the majority of my uh, speaking points have already been made, so in the essence of time, I will take whatever questions you may have from me, and if you don't, I will conclude my testimony. Seeing no questions, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you for your brother. Uh, I'd like to call John, John Brightonski. No, he's been called. Oh, I see, he is. Okay. Oh, that's right. He's the time. Okay, Dan Goodman. Did you already speak? Yeah, he Matt Simon. Quite a bit of reading material. <laughs> For the record, my name is Matt Simon. I live in Manchester and I work for the Marijuana Policy Project. We are a national nonprofit organization located in Washington, D.C. I've personally been advocating for cannabis policy reforms in New Hampshire since 2007 when I founded the New Hampshire Coalition for Common Sense Marijuana Policy. In 2011, I was hired by MPP and my work expanded to Vermont and several other states. So I've had the privilege of working on this issue with state legislatures all over. And I'm going to cram all that into two and a half minutes. So that's not really what's going to happen. Um, I want to make sure I get a few major points out there. First of all, clearly the opponents of House Bill 481 have done a great job today. They've, they've brought a lot of witnesses, including from other states, to testify against this. So the first section of my packet is poll numbers since 
to remind you that this is not, the perception we have in this room is not the perception of what people in New Hampshire actually think about this issue. UNH has done extensive polling. The last two polls statewide have found 68% of Granite Staters do support legalization. Uh, there's a follow-up question in that poll that says, if marijuana is legal for adults, do you think it should be sold in licensed retail outlets and tax? And that's up to 80% support in the most recent poll. That support is across partisan divides, 88% of, I'm sorry, I'm wrong. But you can see all of that there. I don't want to take time explaining it. Um, majorities of grant stators and all demographic groups support legalization, they support regulation. They also support home cultivation, which was established by a similar poll last year. So we're obviously not a state where this can be put on the ballot, have people vote on it if they could. We know this would pass, uh, but that isn't the case. And I'm not going to suggest we should make laws simply because of a poll. However, this is a, we do have a constitutional form of government and one of the aspects in the basic, whether you consider it a democracy or a republic or whatever your preferred term is, legitimate laws and policies are supposed to be based on the consent of the government. And in this case, I would argue they plainly aren't, that we're asking law enforcement to continue enforcing a law against private personal behavior by adults that is very unpopular throughout our state. So why shouldn't we do this? Are the 68% of people badly wrong? Have people like me misled them over the last decade? So I would say no. Um, there are three major sources that were cited today by opponents, and I want to briefly, and this is the last section of your binder, if you want to turn to the end. Um, so uh, Senator Guida mentioned two of the sources. One of them is the Rocky Mountain High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area, or HIDA. Uh, there are HIDAs all over the country. I, I believe the gentleman from AAA mentioned some stats from the Northwest HIDA in Washington. Um, so the article in, in Westward goes into some details on, on this. I think it's just really important to know. HIDA is funded through the Office of National Drug Control Policy. That's the Drug Czar's office. And their 1998 uh, Reauthorization Act, the federal law that uh, allows them to continue to exist, requires that the Office of National Drug Control Policy oppose the legalization of any Schedule I substance. So it's their job, their legal mandate, to try to convince states like New Hampshire not to do what it's considering doing and what its people support doing. So it really asks that any time you see the Rocky Mountain Haida studies or reports being cited, keep in mind that these are not peer reviewed, that these are biased from their very nature of who funds them. And that is why uh, I feel sorry for policymakers who have to try to sort through all of this different data. Because in Vermont, they can set aside three weeks. Like we're gonna do marijuana legalization in our committee, we're gonna have three weeks of testimony, we're gonna hear by phone from all of these people, and we're gonna bring them in if they can. The disparity between what people hear from the state regulators in Colorado is so different from what they hear from Rocky Mountain Haida and others that it's mind boggling And please, read more for, for more details. I'm not going to say there are no issues there, but they're blown dramatically out of proportion in, in a way that's designed to scare them. Um, the second source I want to mention is Mr. Berenson's book, which has already been covered. Well, I'll only mention it very briefly, um, but there are a couple of articles that, that go into that at the very end. Uh, and the last, the last piece of all is the one that I think is most important because it's written by a pediatrician. And he's certainly not saying that marijuana is safe. He's certainly not saying that uh, certainly young people shouldn't use it and should wait until they're older. However, it makes it very clear that alcohol and tobacco are far worse and that cannabis is objectively safer. And in particular, it goes in more detail on the correlation versus the causation. So much of these confusion is rooted in that basic understanding. I think we all learn that hopefully in high school, if not in college, that correlation does not 
equal causation. We hear it so often, especially with the gateway argument that person A used cannabis and then went on to use heroin. Person B used cannabis, went on to use heroin. To do real science on this, we have to look at it objectively and say, what percentage of people who use cannabis move on? Is that the same as other studies? <coughs> people who have done that seriously, even the DEA admits that the science is very weak around the gateway theory. But what I do believe is that there is a gateway that's endemic to prohibition, that prohibition is in fact a gateway policy. Because nobody gets introduced to heroin at the New Hampshire liquor store. As much as I don't necessarily like our liquor monopoly at, at the state level, people who go into those stores are only allowed to buy alcohol, and they have to be 21 to do it. So what we're talking about here is not adding a new drug. We're talking about taking a plant that's been widely used in our state for decades, that has been sold, produced and sold by criminals, and we're trying to shift that hundreds of millions of dollars worth of illicit economic activity, drug dealers who don't check IDs, who do sell more dangerous substances, who sell cannabis that might be 5% or might be 25%, may or may not be loaded down with pesticides or heavy metals or, or other things. We want to bring that under our laws. We want to shift hundreds of millions of dollars in economic activity into the hands of licensed businesses that follow rules, don't sell the kids, and don't sell the heroin. The other source I want to mention is the Centennial, something called the Centennial Institute. Chief Profonsky mentioned it. He said the state of Colorado expects to spend $4.50 for every dollar it takes in for cannabis. So that seemed like a pretty remarkable statistic to me. Colorado spilled $6 billion worth of cannabis since 2014 through its license system. Um, and about $150 million in taxation just last year alone. So we're going to say it's $4.50 for every dollar they take in. The study saying that Colorado is spending over a billion dollars to deal with the effects of legalization. And that is, frankly, ridiculous. Um, the article that I provided, I think, does a pretty good job of explaining why, but the methodology is, is frankly laughable. They don't even look at what the costs were associated with marijuana use prior to legalization. What they do is they very imaginatively add up all of the costs that they think might be associated with marijuana use post legalization and then blame all of that on legalization. So even, for example, arrests. Arrests haven't reduced to zero in Colorado. It's still illegal to grow large amounts and to sell in an unlicensed fashion, so there's still arrests. This report says that there are millions of dollars that are to, that legalization is to blame for these millions of dollars in marijuana arrests that are happening. It's much less than was being spent before. There's less being spent before on treatment, but that's all shown as a cost in this report. So it's, I would argue, the kind of, in this case, true propaganda for somebody who is opposed from day one legalization in their state passed, and they immediately set about the task of trying to produce misleading reports that could then be used to mislead policymakers in other states. So I assume I'm over my three minutes. I'm going to wrap it up real quick. But the question here is not do we want marijuana in New Hampshire? It's already here. The question is do we want grant staters to spend hundreds of millions of dollars buying cannabis from illicit drug dealers, or would we rather have them spending hundreds of millions of dollars from licensed businesses that follow rules and regulations? This guy hasn't fallen in Colorado and other states. There are lessons that we have learned that I think we can do better in New Hampshire. I think most of those lessons are already written in the House Bill 481, and I don't have time to tell you why I think that, so I'd be more than happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Jim. Thank you for your testimony. Do you have any information on how uh, police officers could stop people and identify whether they're under the influence of marijuana? Absolutely. So what we currently have are three levels of police training. There's the standard field sobriety test that every, every police officer learns at the academy. There's something called A-Ride, which is advanced roadside 
impairment detection. And then there's a drug recognition expert, which is the highest level of training. And over the last decade or two, it's become clear that impaired driving is a bigger issue than simply drunk driving. All the messaging previously was don't drink and drive, don't drink and drive, catching drunk drivers. And as prescription drug use has increased, uh, other illicit drug use, cocaine, heroin, certainly opioids, prescription opioids, illegal opiates, uh, a lot of people are impaired, driving impaired on substances that are not alcohol. We have a test for alcohol that we've all learned and have reached a level of scientific comfort with. It's called a breathalyzer. Um, there are some issues with it, but it's mostly accepted by the scientific community. For all of the other substances that can cause impairment, we don't have that. So what states have done is that they've spent money and Colorado has spent a lot of money on taxation to train law enforcement so that a ride training is nearly universal across the state so that DRE, drug recognition expert training, is much more common. Uh, the idea is never for every police officer to be a DRE <laughs> if the driver is uh, found to be impaired. And they do, I, I've heard different statistics. In Vermont, we heard 80%, uh, an 80% conviction rate when a DR testifies in court that a driver is impaired. Uh, it's not as easy as a breathalyzer. I don't think it ever can be. I don't think the science of cannabis will, will ever allow us to pick a number and have that be reliable the same way a .08 is, is, is seen to be reliable. It is illegal to drive while impaired. It is today. It will be tomorrow whether this passes or not. But if this bill doesn't pass, I would argue we have done nothing to make our roads safer. We've already got 15 stores now open in Massachusetts. There's one in Lowell, there's one in Gardner. Anybody who didn't already have access to cannabis in New Hampshire has it now. If they just pop across the border, we're going to see stores in, uh, along the main border probably by the end of this year. Vermont may or may not pass its, its regulation law and, and, and do that. So I would argue this is a really important issue. Cannabis use is already widespread. We need to be educating people about the actual effects of driving. We need to give law enforcement the best tools that we can. Giving them a test that doesn't work, like a saliva test that doesn't tell you anything, It'll simply tell you that somebody has used cannabis somewhat recently it tells you nothing about whether they're impaired or not. Um, so I think the system we have with the DREs is the best, or you might say the least bad system, but it's what's working, and it's what states like Colorado have seen fit to do with the tax money. Let's make sure law enforcement is trained as they can be, and let's have effective public education campaigns that are designed to deter impaired driving regardless, regardless of the source. And as far as usage in the home and how people, you know, may smoke around with children or, you know, what kind of warnings or what, what is done about that in states that have legalized? So I haven't kept up with all the latest campaigns. Colorado, I mean, their first public education campaign and youth education campaign was a disaster. And they'll, all, they'll all tell you that. It's called Don't Be a Lab Rat. They put up these big rat cages around public parks, and like, the message was kids, don't be a lab rat by trying marijuana. And of course, kids were getting in the cages, taking selfies, and it was a big joke, like a lot of other terribly ineffective drug education campaigns have been. And I think they really learned from that, and they've uh, unveiled a number of campaigns that they have tested and found to be much more successful in changing youth attitudes. Uh, and also adult attitudes on public consumption, which of course was your question. Um, I will say, I went to one of the stores in Massachusetts a few weeks ago, and really the first thing I saw when I walked in was a big, not a plaque, but a big sign on the wall that was, if you or a loved one has problems with substance use, cannabis misuse, here is the number to call, here is the website with, with accurate information, uh, couldn't help but notice that of all the times I've bought cannabis in my life that I've never seen a sign or had anybody offer me any sort of information on the effects and the harms of the substance. Uh, this is something that could be included in all of the packaging or, or a handout that's with every sale. I believe 
bill would authorize the department to, to do that. Uh, things like obviously keeping it away from kids, but a lot of people don't know that pregnant women shouldn't use cannabis. Uh, there's enough truth to the mental illness schizophrenia link that somebody who has a family history of mental illness, schizophrenia in particular, sh probably shouldn't use cannabis at all. Probably shouldn't drink either. Or, you know, there are a lot of things they maybe more, should be more careful about than other, other people. But that needs to be part of the education here. Uh, we're, we're experiencing, I think, a backlash from several decades of no, total non-education. I was born in the 70s, grew up in the 80s with, with the war on drugs. They cracked an egg in a skillet and said, this is your brain and questions and they cut to something else. We didn't hang around to answer our questions and there wasn't an internet where we could find out. So when I was a teenager, I was scared to death of it. I thought it killed brain cells. I thought it made young men grow breasts, which is a claim that I heard for the first time a couple years ago. It's been about 20 years since I heard that. A pediatrician in Vermont tried to tell me that that was okay. Not true. Um, <laughs> today, if we try to tell kids things about cannabis that aren't true, they're going to get on their smartphones and they're going to look it up and they're going to say, I don't believe you. And maybe I don't believe other things that you're saying to. I think it's just so important. I was a college instructor for seven years. I don't like it when my students come to school, come to class, stoned. I also don't like it when they show up hungover with 15 stamps on their hands from every bar they went to the night before. Uh, these issues aren't going to go away. Young people are going to consume alcohol, some of them. They're going to consume cannabis, some of them. But as adults, as teachers, parents, whatever our role may be, we need to live in a world where we understand that they are going to have access if they really want it. And that our focus should be on trying to get them to not want it, at least until they're older and in a position to make responsible adult choices. So I think that's cannabis policy in the real world. We can't stamp it out. We can't create a drug-free or marijuana-free this or that or the other thing. But we can bring this plant under our laws, and we can work to minimize its harms with sensible policies. I, I have a question, well, a question and a comment. Um, I believe what I'm hearing you say is that the more, the most effective way to keep our children and our adults safe is to educate, not to legislate. Um, is that? I think we got to legislate. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, not make it illegal, um, uh, but it, but better to regulate and educate. Um, one of the things that we hear a lot about, and I'm sorry, I missed part of the hearing, but one of the things we hear a lot about is the gateway effect. I remember as a high school student hearing that cigarettes were a gateway drug. Um, and, I, and, and what I think that really meant was that people who were smoking cigarettes were also drinking, and not necessarily that because they were smoking cigarettes, it caused them to drink. And I'm just curious what the, literature, if you, if you have it, says about what actually constitutes a gateway drug. If, if you're getting it from, from a dealer, they might be very interested in having you have other drugs, but does that make it a gateway drug, in other words? Yeah, I don't think there's an accepted scientific definition of what a gateway is or isn't. I think most people mean that it's a precursor, and in that sense, they're correct. Most people who use heroin have tried cannabis before they tried heroin. It just stands to reason that that would be likely to be the case. In fact, really until the opioid prescription epidemic went, you know, I think there are a lot of people who have gone straight to heroin and maybe haven't tried cannabis. That's a relatively new phenomenon uh, because the main entry into the opiate addiction is, is, is prescription. Is prescriptions, but... <coughs> Do we have data on how many people have, have tried cannabis and not done one of these? And that's, I, just, I, oh, I always want comp comparison data. Yes, I don't have those numbers handy, but I, I could produce them. I mean, we, know, we know what the number of people who have used heroin in the country is roughly, and we know what the number of people who have used cannabis is roughly. And if <coughs> it's at least 20 times higher, maybe significantly more than that. The vast majority of people who use cannabis do not go on to use more dangerous substances. And of course, what you hear about are 
are the, peop the, the, ter the tragic stories of, of people who, who did use cannabis. But in all, in all these, nearly all these cases, they used alcohol as well, they used tobacco as well, and they may have used other substances, but the order isn't so much what's important. I think the most, and I, I did provide several sources on the gateway theory, uh, but I think what they all suggest is that we look at this more holistically and uh, the term life course. There's a good paper out of UNH, research at UNH wrote that dismisses the, the gateway theory and says that it's much more thoughtful to look at this from the perspective of what are young people's lives like? If a person in their teens is struggling, uh, you know, whether it's parents are divorced or there, there's something else going on in the home or they're being bullied or they have whatever, whatever problems they have, they're much more likely to have a wide range of issues and they're also much more likely to use illegal substances. Uh, people who are predisposed to mental illnesses are much more likely to use illicit substances very difficult to tease causality out of that relationship when you hear that so many people who have anxiety, depression, bipolar, uh, even schizophrenia, are using cannabis to self-medicate, and in some cases it's helping. In some cases it's not helping them, and in many cases it can make it worse, and in some cases it's helping them, and that's why they're using it. It wasn't the cause, it was an attempt at a solution. So. Uh, Really, that's where I think Mr. Barrison's book does such a disservice, and that the researchers who set, set it straight overwhelmingly said that these are complex relationships that are multi-directional, and the National Academy of Sciences report absolutely did not <laughs> say that cannabis use causes schizophrenia. That's just completely irresponsible. Thank you. Are there other questions? Um, I think I saw Representative Romney enter. Yes, great, thank you. It's in the report on the second page, you can see. Uh, the one thing we did do is we, we, we took testimony from 47 witnesses, including the eight original states that had testified. We had Skyped in uh, as far away as Alaska, uh, Colorado, all, all the western states. And then we had Massachusetts and Maine both came to us in person and testified. Our goal was to, un to learn from their mistakes. So we heard the testimony and it was good. And matter of fact, we got a lot of compliments as a state for uh, putting the horse before the cart and not the cart before the horse. You gotta understand the, the eight original states, it was it became law via referendum votes. We're not a referendum state. So what happened in those states, the people were ahead of the legislatures. And, and matter of fact, it did. We, we heard testimony from the various uh, usually it was somebody from their commission as well as the state legislator who was involved. They had, a, they had a go from the referendum vote to making law that made sense. And uh, but with that said, there were some, some earlier states made some big mistakes uh, that they've now corrected. Uh, and again, we, we learned from those, those mistakes because of the report that we, and we incorporated those ideas in the report. And there were uh, we made 54 recommendations, uh, and I will, uh, the, the, the drafters of this bill, uh, uh, Rennie, uh, Representative Cushing, uh, did incorporate a lot of these into the report. Um, many, I would have liked to have seen in the report more as uh, within the statute versus uh, rules. There are a lot of things that we talked about that are uh, leading up to the rules to, to come up with. 
the one the one major thing that's still out of this bill that I'd like to see is an opt-in provision. Uh, right now, it's really a, a community can opt out, uh, but the, the uh, commission was pretty adamant that we should have an opt-in. Opt-in is something that New Hampshire does a lot of. Uh, when it comes to lottery, we just did opt-in with Kino. And here, that, did, that allows the citizens of those communities to actually weigh in whether they want a marijuana business in their community, whether it be a retail site, a growth site, uh, manufacturer, uh, they would have to vote those in the way we envision the, the opt-in clause. So that, that piece is included. I did do a side-by-side -side of, the, of the bill versus what was in the commission report, uh, but a lot of the things that were in the original bill got amended, put most of it in, in ways of means. So some of the stuff is there now. The big one that's missing is the is the opt-in opt provision. Um, the one thing that, the, the, the one, again, I'm wearing my neutral hat here. The, the one, one thing that I saw as a positive of legalization is the, um, is the fact that someone who buys the substance knows what's in it because of testing. The testing is the fourth arm of, of, this, of this thing. So that was positive. The other thing that, that as, as a uh, commission, we said pretty emphatically that we shouldn't be doing this for the revenue. We should do it to make enough revenue to, cost the, to cover the cost of regulation and to have, have money enough money for uh, addiction prevention and treatment. Beyond that, you know, no. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a second. So, but those are the kind of the main themes. Um, the commission met 27 times. Like I said, we heard a lot of testimony, and the only the only literature we looked at was peer-reviewed papers, because you 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 pick up stuff. This is good. You pick up the next thing. It says this is bad, and whatever the topic is, even in within even within the peer-reviewed stuff, there's, there's competing views on a lot of this. But the only thing that's in the report, and it's in the last section, we have some peer-reviewed uh, papers that we recommend uh, people look at if they're interested. So that's, that's the, the commission's work. Now, now I'm going to change my hat, and, and now I'm a legislator. And I, you know, I've given this a lot of thought, and I had a front row seat for a year on this. <clears throat> I'll give you five or six themes here. You know, why am I against? And I get this asked all the time. And I had reporters for a year asking me which way do I lean on this. And it, it, to me, it's, it normalizes it in the eyes of adolescents. Normalization, just keep that in mind. Uh, and there's no question, and the one thing that is true that we found out from our or all the testimony we got. The study shows the fix on brain development for young people is clear. It impairs thinking, memory, learning functions are affected. There's no question about it. If they're habitual users when they're young, it really does a lot to impair their brain development for everything, and that stays with them. So that's, that's number one. It's the normalization that we're, we're doing. We're saying to our youth, well, mom and dad could do it, it's okay for us. The other thing, and, I, and some of the people behind me have heard me say this, it's, it's not your grandpa's marijuana anymore. You've got to understand this. You know, there are surveys that say 57% of the people in the state, you know, want legalization. I think that was the last major study done uh, by the UNH a year ago or so. That, <clears throat> but, but when people think, when people hear that, what they're thinking of is, is marijuana with 3% THC. That doesn't exist anymore it's in the bill. <clears throat> but in recent, recent uh, reports are showing that there's still big problems with edibles because you can't control the amount that someone consumes. So even if you say a dose is so much, they can eat the whole package of cookies or whatever it is. 
and there, there are a lot of uh, reports. There was one recently in the uh, uh, Annals of uh, Internal Medicine, I think it was Internal Medicine, on, on cases like people committing suicide under the influence of, you know, too much of this, uh, of things like that. So, but anyway, it's not to be on pause marijuana anymore. You can understand that the dose, the, 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 the magnitude is, is very high. Uh, there is, someone's probably already mentioned, there's no roadside impairment testing. It isn't like they haven't tried. This, whoever invents that is going to be really rich. They've been, they've been working it, and there's still no roadside. And we, I think when I was here, someone mentioned uh, banking. I know there's some, some legislature, legislation at federal level trying to deal with that. Uh, but as of now, and most, a lot of the states told us it was cash business, including um, taxation being paid by wheelbarrows of cash coming into the, they have counting rooms, cash counting rooms. So as of now, and we had a member of the banking commission on, our, on, the, on, the, on the marijuana commission, and they, uh, they said, no way our New Hampshire bank's going to touch this money. Well, Right now, you say, well, what about our uh, therapeutic cannabis program? <coughs> well, Century Bank of Massachusetts is the only bank that, that's the bank that's been working with our, our, our medical marijuana folks. They've already stated that they're not going to take on any more business from here, just so you know. <clears throat> and those are some major themes. I, there's other things that I, I could mention. I, I, overall, I, don't, I just don't think there's a societal need for, for capital points. I mean, there's only downside on this. Uh, the other thing I just want to point out is in, in the bill itself, uh, and this is a ways and means thing, in terms of how the money gets uh, uh, allocated, uh, if you go to page, uh, the bill, you go page 18 to page 19. So we wanted to make sure that there was enough money for addiction and all that prevention, et cetera. But the way the bill works is that the first cut of money every year comes off the top for regulation. Then the 100000 goes to Department of Safety for a uh, data collection function. Then the rest, after that, then that, that 100 is another 100% now, 29% goes to prevention and all. 33 goes to the municipalities. 5% goes to public safety, and 33% goes to the general fund. The only problem with that is, if it's a low revenue period, that we will probably short prevention, because it's in the competition with these others. I would prefer to see that above that line as, as being up there with, with, uh, you know, with the, you know, money allocated for, for, you know, the oversight and all that also have that money up front, not competing with the general fund for that money. Okay, that's the way this cascade, the way it cascades, it does put it kind of on line. So that's one thing I would fix. And then the, the other thing I do have a problem with in, in, that, in that line 13 where the 33% goes to municipalities, uh, 16 actually, line 16 talks about based on special costs incurred by those municipalities, or special benefits contributed to those municipalities due to the occurrence of cannabis. What they're saying is that, that the commission can decide to allocate not equally across all municipalities, but they, they, can, they, can, they can reward a uh, community that has a, a cannabis place. And I think that's enticement, to be honest with you. I think we're saying to a community, Hey, we got a place we can get. We can get money. I, I have a problem with that. The way it's written, I have a problem with the money going to municipalities if it was equally allocated. But this bill doesn't have it equally allocated. It has it. It has it based on the on the on the, uh, the cannabis commission to make those judgments. And uh, again, that's that's the only other problem I have uh, with the bill specifically at the moment. In that regard. So. Those are my comments, and um, I'm, anytime, I know there's a lot of other people who want to speak in this lunch time, uh, but I think any questions you may have, and I'll come back anytime if you, you, you have a work session on this. Thank you very much for your testimony. Yes,
Would you have any objection to the commercial cultiva uh, cultivation and growth of marijuana for the export to Canada? I don't know if that would be legal uh, from a federal standpoint. We border Canada and if it was legal in New Hampshire to grow, it's legal in Canada, I believe. If that was a possibility to export it to Canada, we well, have any objection? If it was legal, if it was legal, I wouldn't have an objection. But the real issue is, is that my understanding is that as long as it's federally illegal, that we can only, we cannot import marijuana from, we have to grow our own here. We can't, we can't import it from another state because it's still crossing state borders. And we never really touched on in the commission international sales. So I'm not sure about that, but the main concern is that federally, and that's why I said, um, so you touched on the house floor, that, 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 that you don't expect this to be like alcohol or cigarettes for us, which we get cross-border sales. Technically, we're, we're not going to be advertising as a state, come buy marijuana here, because it's illegal for people to come over and buy marijuana. Now, if they use it here, that's one thing. But if they go back across the border, it's still federally illegal. So I, I, I really doubt that that we will promote come, come buy your marijuana here because the implication is that people will take it back across the border. And, you know, because that, that came up in the, in the context of uh, how do we price it? Do we want our prices to be even lower as we do with, with our, our cigarette tax? We make sure that they're always lower to, to attract people to buy cigarettes here. That's not the same thing. Um, that, that won't be the same thing with, with marijuana. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks so much for coming back. Um, I'd just like to say that we are halfway through the list of people, and we have another committee coming in here now in about 20 minutes. Um, so we are going not going to get through everybody. If you signed on late on the list, um, you may want to come back when, because at the end of this, we will be recessing. We will not be closing the testimony. We will be recessing. The, test, the, the hearing will still be open, and we will reconvene on uh, May 7th at 9 a.m., just so you know. Um, I'm, we're going to have time, depending on how long you take, and I need to really try to keep people moving, as well as our questions. <laughs> but you, you two have done well. Are you trying to silence me, <laughs> I put it, let's get back yeah, to that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Madam Chair, may I just, um, I'm Deb Narrow and a lead organizer for SAM New Hampshire with a science-based policy makers under the national uh, umbrella. And we have brought in three expert witness, witnesses from out of state mm -hmm. that, that need to um, catch planes, is it possible? <laughs> that they could, because they won't be able to come back on May 7th. Are these the ones that it, 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 it's, I drove an hour to get here. I didn't right. speak to you. Right. I don't know why you think more important than that. Okay, okay. okay. Um, <laughs> would you mind getting that list? Yes. I mean, basically, they're not going to be able to. It sounds like that. I mean, when she says recess, we'll check on that. It sounds like that's what we'll do this. I mean, they had to be people. Okay, just so everybody knows, before anyone gets, I know everyone wants to speak, and I appreciate the process. We are going to see if we can move the, the, the uh, committee that's coming in here after this to see if we can um, to see if we can stay a little longer than 20 minutes. We, we shall see. I want to. I, I want everyone to be able to speak. Um, and. As someone who drives an hour and a half myself to get here, I understand that driving an hour and back and not being able to speak is also a problem. Everybody has a reason why they want to speak. So we'll do the best job we can. If we can move the hearing, uh, the commerce hearing, then we will, we will try to do that. Um, some of us also have committee meetings right after this. So 
It's it's common. I have a question for you, Senator. Are you going to reconvene this on May 7th? Yeah. Yes, sure. this will be reconvened on May 7th for okay. sure at 9 a.m. Okay. So anyone who can come Pierce, back easily till then. You can, you can slot me off. I'll speak to you May 7th then. We'll allow, we'll allow folks that came in to go. Thank you. And are you going sequentially to this, yes. Senator? Uh -huh. I was like number seven or eight on that. Yeah. Not necessarily. We have representatives and senators go first. And other things. And there are others who say, are there yeah. More important? <laughs> what are there other people more important than citizens to go forward? No, no, no. We, but we have a lot of citizens. But we right. have I'm just saying I was on the first page okay. about halfway through. Okay. Is your name Patrick? It is. Why don't you come up next? And please try to keep to your, your time. I'm not a lobbyist, so I will keep to my time. Uh, I come as a, uh, as, as, I'm sorry, as, as, my name is Patrick Testament. I'm a retired Air Force officer, Lieutenant Colonel, and combat veteran, but I come here in many roles. One is a husband of a cancer patient uh, who has been uh, told that marijuana would be the thing that would help her, and we will not take it because of what we have learned about marijuana and what else is out there and what the implications would be. One is a father of a child and young adults whose generation is ravished by drugs. Again, I'm an officer, retired officer and combat vet with many colleagues suffering with wounds, physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual, not only from combat and society, but some by drugs themselves and their false comforts. I now have several jobs. One was as a former airline pilot who I don't think you ever wanted flying uh, under the intoxication or the influence of these drugs. I now serve though as a pastor who has counseled many of those friends from the military and others and witnessed the destruction of false hope of drugs, including marijuana, on individuals, families, and communities. I am a part-time cop who serves and witnesses the front lines like the EMT that spoke earlier, and who has had to, the first-hand experience with what happens uh, with marijuana and its follow-on effects. And we know it is a gateway. And now it's laced with fentanyl, so we have that going for us. Under this new law, 18F2, Section 2, it would make me a criminal if I discussed what I saw at one of these houses where the kids inadvertently took drugs. I'm a small farmer who knows the false promises of a natural cash crop, knowing that GMO is alive and well, that as said before, there's nothing in common with Hawaiian gold of my generation and Girl Scout cookies of this. Pfizer 420 will come when it eventually becomes federally legal and we'll have GMO problems there and we'll add fentanyl with the counterfeits and the uh, counterfeits. I'm a citizen, not a lobbyist. I see the destructive effect of cannabis and other drugs in my neighborhood, community, state, and nation. I'm a taxpayer. I know that it would take $1.5 million to train just for one year 25% of our cops to be DREs. Fellow parents, we know that everyone is doing it is a lousy excuse to join them. Fellow citizens, we know that there is much more than goodwill and good of community that is funding all these orange name tags here today. Fellow leaders, I ask you to join with me and stand against the tide of relevance and expedience and even party loyalty and vote inexpedient to legislate. And fellow humans, please stand with us against this danger, this attack, and this sickness. I'll take any questions. Thank you very much for your testimony. And I would like to, at this point, if you're, if you're here, I'd like to call Good afternoon. 
management. <laughs> I will be very brief. I know that you um, have been sitting patiently through this testimony and um, you have many more behind me. Um, so I prepared testimony and I brought several articles. I will not go through them. Um, what I will do is just uh, briefly highlight um, some of the assumptions in here and counter those that this is a responsible piece of legislation and it's not a responsible piece of legislation. It's not a responsible way to commercialize marijuana. Um, there are principles when you talk about responsible marijuana commercialization that protect children and health, promote public health leadership and local control, minimize cannabis dependency um, on health and social harms by having targeted campaigns um, previous to legalization as well as funding for prevention, treatment, and recovery. And you would, uh, we talked a lot about social justice and equity. Um, you would also have components of that in this bill. So I will briefly say, it did not protect children. There are no limits on potency um, on THC. Um, you heard about the high risk. You heard about the connection to psychosis and dependence and other ne uh, negative effects. It does not ban edibles. It does not limit any kind of high potency products like shatters, wax, and dabs. They're all free game. It doesn't pro um, prohibit in the statute anything like cannabis infused soda or other non-edible um, flavored products that we have seen a lot with jewels. Um, and it does not restrict marketing and advertising through all forms of media, including social media and billboards. Um, there are no prohibitory prohibitions, statutory prohibitions on marketing and advertising. It leads it all up to a cannabis commission, which is my second point, is promoting public health leadership and local control. Um, if you had responsible commercialization from the start of the process, you would have public health authorities in leadership roles. This creates a cannabis commission, and no person shall be appointed if they ever oppose marijuana commercialization. It also creates a Cannabis Advisory Council. Nine of the 11 seats are represented by the marijuana industry. It would also allow a certain amount of local control. You heard from Representative Abrami that that's not the case in with this bill as far as the opt-in versus the opt-out. It would look at mechanisms like the three-tier system, like how we do it for alcohol, you know, and, then, and have um, it regulated by the state. Um, those have been teamed out to be much more effective than just opening this up to the outside industry. Um, it would minimize, um, it would look at ways to minimize um, the negative effects that we absolutely know are there. A portion of the money should go to prevention, treatment, and recovery. They watered that down in ways and means. It's not a direct transfer. It goes to the general fund and that's appropriated. That's never been effective for the, al uh, effective for the alcohol fund. We have an alcohol fund at which 5% is supposed to go to prevention, treatment, and recovery. That happened once in 13 years. Um, you would also have some upfront funding to look at, you've heard all these things about education and how do we keep the harms down. No state has spent any money previous to legalizing. That's what we need to do so to address the, um, the false perceptions of harm, the motor vehicle accidents, the increased risk of psychosis that we know there it is related to, and use during pregnancy. We need to get ahead of that curve. Um, and there's nothing in 481 that does it. We heard a lot about social justice and equity. Per, um, I agree with that. Responsible commercialization would make equity and social justice a priority in the cannabis industry and create economic benefits from cannabis legalization in communities that were negatively affected by the war of drugs and avoid the emergence of big marijuana in New Hampshire. There is no mechanism in this bill whatsoever to engage people from communities that disproportionate impact and ensure their inclusion in the industry. It is, it favors an industry of already existing uh, alternative treatment centers both in state and big industries out of state. Um, you also heard a lot about um, the disproportionate arrest in New Hampshire among people of color. Um, you know, that does not go away when you commercialize illegal, when you commercialize marijuana. We heard that from the ACLU. Interestingly enough, there's a statistic from ACLU in Washington state that found um, shortly after, two years after they legalized, that it was three times more likely that black adults would be arrested than white adults. Um, for marijuana charges. And in 2016, the Colorado Department of Public Safety three times 
um, the number of black juveniles get arrested compared to white juveniles. So it is a systematic issue that we have to talk about when we talk about social disparities. It's not just the fact if you commercialize marijuana, it'll go away. And um, 41 has no mechanism in place to look at equity, look at these communities that have been harmed on the war of drugs. Um, so those are, um, oh, I also did want to get back to, there was a question about, that was asked of marijuana policy project regarding research and gateway. Um, I will admit that, the, you know, the gateway theory has, is, um, some argue there is one, some argue there isn't. What absolutely we do know is that nine times out of ten, any youth that has experimented with any drug, alcohol, marijuana, cigarettes, nine times out of ten is likely to have a substance use disorder later in life. That's what we have to be concerned about when you talk about legalizing another drug. Thank you. Questions? None. Thank you very much. Um, with respect to the chair, if I may just ask, um, so we have two folks. I'm from Colorado, and, and I would love to be able to contribute that experience. We also have a, a PhD from Maryland who you know, traveled up overnight. So it'd be, it'd be, we're not going to be able to come back for the, the second hearing. So we, I would greatly appreciate your consideration if we could. Uh, well, I can't come back. So just so everybody knows, we are going to keep going. The conference is moving, and we'll okay. keep going until Great. everyone has the opportunity Thanks. to speak. Great. Thank you. Um, so, nonetheless, even though we're going to keep going, some of us are now missing another committee, so we appreciate still that you keep it as short as you possibly can. Obviously, a lot has already been said, so whatever you can add that has not been said would be appreciated. Um, Lisa Powers left. Uh, Dina Stockton Maneuver. Can't read it, I'm sorry. No? Wow, this is fun. Marley Terrell. Welcome. Good morning. Chairwoman and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Marley Carroll, and I'm from Pennacher, New Hampshire. Uh, I'm here today in support of House Bill 481 for many reasons. As of right now, if I were to be caught selling marijuana, I could do up to 20 years in jail and receive a fine up to $300,000. Uh, pedophiles often do less time. Meanwhile, if I was 21 and drove north for less than four hours, I would legally be able to purchase marijuana. If I drove east for one hour, I would legally be able to purchase marijuana. If I drove south for one hour, I would legally be able to purchase marijuana. And if I were to drive west, guess what? I'd legally be able to purchase marijuana. Why is it that NH is left behind in a very lucrative industry? Many of NH doctors created our opioid epidemic by overprescribing opiates because the pharmaceutical industry, the pharmaceutical industry incentivizes them to do so. Our doctors are one step from being heroin dealers, yet there is no punishment for turning people into drug addicts and ruining their lives. Meanwhile, someone who sells a plant proven to help, help people kick heroin addiction can get sent to the same prison cell as a rapist and will do it equal time. I truly believe it is time for NH to stop rewarding doctors for selling government heroin and start treating those who enjoy pot as humans and not criminals. Massachusetts expects to make up to $82 million by the end of 2019 from recreational marijuana. That is $82 million no longer going to criminals, but instead possibly going to funding schools, building roads, and other wonderful things you can do with that much tax revenue. Now that NH is surrounded by legal states and even bordering a legal country, why should we miss out on so much tax revenue? People smoke marijuana no matter what the laws are, especially with how surrounded we are with legal weed. So why not cash in? I can't tell you how easy it is to buy marijuana in NH. Like, I hate that we even pretend that legalizing marijuana will make it any more accessible than it already is. I can, I can list well over a dozen people, well, I'm not going to, obviously, but uh, <laughs> I can list over a dozen people where I could go right now within half an hour and get some marijuana. And if one of those guys doesn't have it, I'll go to the next guy. There's so many. It's, it's endless. And most of these people that I can buy these drugs from are under the age of 18. Uh, and the rest of them under the age of 21. Uh, many high schoolers. Children. 
who I can buy these drugs from. So if our police department can't stop children from selling drugs, how can we expect to stop anyone from selling drugs in New Hampshire? Uh, legalization doesn't just stop at no longer arresting people for possession of marijuana. If any is going to do legalization right, you must clear all criminal records for nonviolent marijuana convictions and free anyone who is in jail for nonviolent crime involving possession or distribution of marijuana. All fines should also be paid back. Uh, I also believe that Governor Sununu uh, offer, needs to offer an apology on behalf of New Hampshire to the black communities who have been disproportionately affected by marijuana prohibition. Um, every day, marijuana becomes more mainstream as marijuana is far less harm harmless than alcohol or tobacco, and even as many medicinal values, unlike alcohol or tobacco. If you compare the stats between marijuana use and who it affects and how, I, it's, it's drastically less than the uh, statistics involving alcohol and cigarettes. Cigarettes kill millions. Cigarettes have killed more than the Holocaust. Marijuana has killed less than sharks. So, yet we treat marijuana like it's heroin. But marijuana's increasing popularity leaves any with two options. Reverse the injustice and legalize recreational marijuana and make millions in tax revenue, or wait for marijuana to inevitably become federally legal anyways, forcing NH into legalization. It is time for NH to modernize its laws and support a bill that would do nothing but good for our economy and granite staters. And I also heard people mention marijuana makes you violent. Marijuana does not make you violent. Talk to anyone who smokes marijuana, they will tell you it does not make you violent. That is pseudoscience nonsense. It's just not true. It's, there's no real evidence to back that up. And yeah, I guess that's all I have for today. Thank you for your time. Any questions would be gladly accepted. Thank you very much for, for coming today. Uh, and I would like next to call um, Christine Miller. Yeah, um, do I hand these out? They've been testimony. Yes, I might take a start on by addressing a couple of points that Matt Simon brought up. Um, in particular, the issue of whether you have to have a genetics risk for, for schizophrenia, family history. And what I'd like to say first of all is that my research career was dedicated to schizophrenia. I'm a neuroscientist and I studied it for over 25 years, uh, 10 years at Johns Hopkins. And what I can tell you is that the majority, the vast majority of schizophrenia cases have no family history and either a first or second degree relative. So for the vast majority of cases, we don't know what causes it. It could be two different genes coming in from different sides of the family that interact poorly. Um, but to say that a, a family history is required is false. And this has been studied in the UK where they actually have looked at what happens when you administer purified THC to individuals with no family history they find that they can see in the course of the day psychotic symptoms emerge in 40%. Not all of the people, but we don't know why that 40% you know, are more, more vulnerable. So the point is you can't predict ahead of time who's going to be at risk. And that's why it is so dangerous. And that's why in comparison to alcohol, where you can say, again, something you know, Matt Simon pointed out that you know, alcohol is more dangerous, in terms of responsible use, actually it's not. So you could say two servings per week, if I told my then, you know, 21 year old son, absolutely, you're gonna be fine, no problem, as long as you're not driving. Uh, you cannot say that for marijuana. Two servings per week of the moderate strength marijuana, so we're talking, you know, below 15%, is the level that increases the risk of psychosis. So those are the issues with respect to Matt Simon's presentation. And then I'd like to laud the young high school student, I guess, in the day they that condition left, but she was very astute in her answering of some of your questions. And she was correct that the marijuana use rate in adults goes up in the states that have legalized. So when she was talking about children being exposed, more exposed in the home, more likely to be exposed, she was right. And that's data collected by the federal government, the 
this and under the auspices, you know, of the Health and of Human Services Department, NSCUH studies, that's the, you know, the, the blue chart. Uh, the median increase is 50% in the states that have been legalized. So that's a pretty big increase in the space of, you know, a few years of legalization. Um, the other issue is, you know, what is the evidence for causation and enemies? Um, the op-ed that I gave you, um, I go through all of that. This was just published in, in Baltimore Sun last week. Maryland is considering a ballot initiative that's exactly the wrong forum for, that, for this sort of technical question. Here I have a hope, and other professionals have done so. They've done a great job of educating you about the technical specifics. It is so hard to get that message out to the public. And that is one reason that the polling numbers show such great support. Because the public does not know this issue about you know, schizophrenia risk. Um, they will know if we become like Amsterdam, for example, where the most recent studies show that 50% of people entering psychiatric clinics for psychosis have a cannabis use disorder. 50% is what they call the population attributable, attributable risk. So in 2002, the cost of schizophrenia to the U.S. was $62.7 billion in healthcare, housing, and indirect costs like <coughs> loss of productivity. If you factor in the 8% population attributable risk, risk in 2002 to what we would expect if we became like Amsterdam, where half of the people entering clinics have a cannabis and psychosis, we would at least double that number. And I would encourage you, you can have someone contact me, I can help with the calculations, but someone in your comptroller's office should really calculate what the net cost is going to be. I mean, it's huge. It's a very expensive illness. And the evidence for cause and effect, you know, Matt Simon, I noticed, didn't have the courage to say anymore that those you know, that the correlation doesn't equal causation for psychosis. So finally backed off of that. And the reason is because the epidemiological studies are huge. There's so many now in Europe, predominantly where they found there's a dose-response correlation in pharmacology that's indicative of, um, that's your second sheet, I think. And, and on the back of um, the sheet that has the truth of the brain are all the references. Um, there's a dose response correlation, there's a temporal relationship. They study thousands of teens in Europe and they find the marijuana use precedes the psychosis, not by versa. Not, not that some people who become mentally ill don't start using, of course, but the majority of cases, the marijuana use precedes the psychosis. It is the worst recreational drug. More than any other recreational drug, once you have a psychotic break from marijuana, you are 50% will go on to develop schizophrenia within eight years. That's a huge risk factor. The second most likely is methamphetamine, and that's down, or I'm sorry, amphetamine, it's down around 30%. LSD is less than that, PCP is less than that. This is the worst recreational drug with a disease that I care the most about that I devoted my research career to. Um, so basically, you know, that concludes my presentation. You know, there are other psychiatric harms, um, bipolar disorders in its infancy. I think it will end up being the same as schizophrenia, but that data is not solid yet. Suicide, it, marijuana is like any other recreational drug that can be abused, including alcohol. It increases the risk for suicide dramatically, and we have an out of control suicide rate in this country. It's just going up dramatically. And I believe that marijuana could be one cause of that. But it's not unique. It, you know, compared to other drugs, it's about the same. Where it is unique is psychosis. It's just hands down the worst drug. So thank you for your attention. I have a quick question. And that's sure. that it's my understanding that, that uh, schizophrenia, the, the incidence in our population <coughs> is approximately one in a thousand. I know it's one in a hundred approximately, but there's no firm number in this country because we don't report schizophrenia to the CDC. It's not like flu. It does not report it. We actually have no idea in this country. In Scandinavia, 
They know, they track it, they have seen an increase since the marijuana use increase. So um, we have no idea in this country. So thank you, sir. Uh, and thank you, Mr. We, uh, I'd like to call uh, Beth's here. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. My name is Catherine Antley. I'm a physician. I am a laboratory director, dermatic pathologist. I serve patients in New York, Vermont, and New Hampshire. Um, and I'm here today because uh, physicians across the country are concerned. And I am concerned about the legalization and commercialization of marijuana. We care about our patients. We understand that uh, lobbying groups can affect change that affects the health of our, of our patients and, and our children, and um, that they pursue profit uh, over uh, the well-being of, of patients, and that's uh, concerning. I have no conflicts of interest. I do not take money from the marijuana industry or any industry. So how will the legalization of marijuana impact the people of, your, of uh, New Hampshire? And will they be concerned more for your loved ones or for profit? Uh, what will be the net cost to your state um, after you account for the marijuana tax? 
And um, if you look at the ER visits, hospitalization, addiction rates, um, morbidity, and mortality. So in states that have legalized marijuana, um, every day in ERs, every single day, Colorado, uh, Oregon, Washington State, California, uh, marijuana toxicity poisoning comes in the, day, in the door every single day. Um, conditions that were once rare show up every day. The number of ER visits with marijuana-related diagnosis has shot up 830% from 2006 to 2016 in Tripp's Hospital in California. Um, that's from 1,000 to 10,000 in those years. And that's according to the uh, head, the chair of the uh, emergency room uh, department, uh, Dr. Lev. In Colorado, we're seeing similar alarming figures of increasing ER visits and increasing hospitalizations. Um, they went from 575 in 2009 to 2,696 in 2015. Um, during that time, these states witnessed uh, the emergence of an altered um, industrialization of marijuana, which you've heard about here a couple of times, 60 times the rate the concentration of THC in a Woodstock joint. So that comes from Jonathan Calkins, who's a professor um, in Pennsylvania, but also with the Rand Corporation. And uh, he says, uh, you know, if you take your cup of coffee and take that 60 times and ingest it, the caffeine is borderline lethal. So change in concentration is a change in substance. And that's not reflected in the laws and policies of the, country, of the states that are, are, are passing these laws. Um, so uh, the flower concentration, as we've here heard as well, is up to 22% and, and more. We need specialized rigs with blow torches to uh, take this. And they're using butane and very dangerous chemicals in order to extract this. We're getting severe. Um, burns, whole body burns, very expensive, very debilitating, life-changing uh, um, harm. So uh, why, why is this happening in our legalized uh, commercialized states? What, what, is the, the, what is the engine behind this? In order to understand this, we need to learn about the economics of addiction. So the economics of addiction are different from the economics of selling a car or a toaster or a coat or building a road or a building. The economics of addiction depend on the creation of a person who intakes many times a day um, of the substance every single day. So somewhat 80% of the product, with marijuana it's even greater than that, 80% of the product is consumed by 20% or less of the people. Therefore, if you are a customer who partakes once a week, once a month, once a day, you have you do not calculate into the business model of the lobbyists or the in industry or the investors or the companies who are going into marijuana. They are only interested in creating people with substance abuse disorders. There's two ways that they create people with substance abuse disorders. They target children and they target children and the entire population with very concentrated THC, and we've seen both of those things happen. And what's really concerning is that the laws that legislators have passed and put into place, the regulations, the cannabis control boards, have been uh, unable to uh, control this. So in Colorado, the law says you may not advertise to children, and yet we have prolific advertising um, to children. I have some photos to show you. One really concerning thing is, for example, in Washington State, uh, they have something called the Washington uh, Control Board, Cannabis Control Board. And uh, their uh, calls to poison uh, centers went up from 190 to 378. In response to this concerning poisoning of their children and grandchildren, sisters, brothers, nieces, aunts, of course, they um, passed a, a rule banning gummy bears and edibles. And it was to go into effect this month, April 2019. Before the, and before they went into effect, they said the companies could continue to sell out their inventory. In between the time they passed the rule and it went into effect, um, the industry objected, they pressurized the board, and the board reversed their decision, siding with industry profit over their own grandchildren's best interests. So this is a concerning fact that we're seeing you know, all across uh, um, the country. 
In, we've heard about secondhand smoke. In Colorado, there was a study that released the American Academy of Pediatrics 2016. One in six children who were admitted to the hospital for bronchitis, upper respiratory diseases, test positive for THC. They're getting secondhand smoke. And our non-white minorities <coughs> were more likely to be positive. So that's, children don't have a choice about where, they're, uh, where they live and they're being exposed to secondhand smoke. May I ask you, are you, do you have testimony to turn in because, uh, so we can all read it or is this? I can do it, sure. Okay, just because we're, we're way past the time and we need a lot more. Right, I hear right. Um, so I just wanted to let you know that the teen, there's been a lot of confusing uh, information about teen use in Colorado. One number that's not ambiguous is the number of ER um, admissions for teens. And that number has gone from 160 to 177 for marijuana-related admissions. So that clearly, those, that group of people clearly has been harmed and are admitted at, at higher rates. So I just want to uh, go through so you can understand what it means of uh, cannabis hyperemesis syndrome that the lady just uh, talked about. Um, this is a description from an ER doctor in Colorado. Picture a 25-year-old woman with a loud, audible retching who's writhing in, in abdominal pain. You can hear her agony from across the emergency department. We term this condition scrawny. It's a combination of screaming and vomiting, and it's the hallmark of cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. This is a syndrome which was a case report before the commercialization of marijuana, and now it happens every single day in Colorado and California ERs. She's now exposed to strong um, opioids in order to control the pain, She's exposed to multiple CT scans, radiation in order to, to uh, work up her abdominal pain. But again, we know it's the weed. And, uh, but she will not stop smoking because, because of the addiction. And there are even uh, people who are literally starving to death but can't stop the addiction and uh, continue to suffer from cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. This is a very expensive disease. In, Cal in uh, Colorado, they it's, had three minutes. it's been calculated She's that people, an expert. it's been calculated that she She's been up here for like 20 minutes. So I don't think I have a chance to Please don't speak from there. I've, I've been sitting here for four hours. I have to go get my son in 20 minutes. And we have everybody sitting up here for 20 minutes. You said three minutes, right? I did, I did, and thank you. But it's, it's up to us to make that decision. Thank you for your- Really? So her testimony is more important please, than everybody else's? No, please stop speaking, and I would like you to complete your testimony, as I said earlier. Of course. So the costs are very expensive, $2 million per hospital, and hospitals are going bankrupt in Colorado because of this. I know healthcare profession is under a, a pressure, healthcare hospitals are, are, are stressed. We're, we're seeing that Colorado spend $2,000 less per student on education than the rest of the country, so it's not uh, helping uh, with the students as it was um, promised. We're also seeing a number of fatalities. So marijuana is associated with um, palpitation. Can you wrap up so that we can get other people have, have of course. So um, you can turn that in if you like your testimony. Of course, sure. sure. Um, and uh, and so we also have we have calculated the number of people who are dying from these cardiac strokes um, and cardiac events, and we submit that to you as well. Um, lastly, um, I think it's important that uh, physicians are listened to. We do see the pain, we do see the suffering that comes in the door. Um, we are not paid by the industry. And uh, I guess I would conclude by saying, um, enabling this industry will mean creating a population of consumers dependent on a toxin, um, which will then have a direct negative impact on the overall public health in New Hampshire. So our conclusion is that in New Hampshire it would be wise to follow the advice of numerous medical societies, including Vermont, New Hampshire, Delaware, Connecticut, New York, and New Hampshire, and recommend it against legalization, especially commercialization of marijuana. Thank you. You're Can we ask that the people that you've asked us to have speak, please speak for three minutes or less? Yes. And when I tell you it's time to stop, I really mean it. Yeah, don't worry, I, 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 I'm going to.
I understand. No, no, yes. I can't even imagine how much you're absorbing at this point anyway, so I, I will definitely keep it brief. Uh, yes, my name is Luke Nicolatos. I'm the Chief of Staff and Senior Policy Advisor at SAM, Smart Approaches to Marijuana. Um, I live in Denver, Colorado. Um, I'm you know, raising my now two and a half year old daughter. Um, she's a fuzzy headed little tornado that changed our life. Um, and, you know, I, you've heard every stat, I think, in the books on either side of this, so I'm not going to bury you with stats. Um, I want to talk about just a couple of uh, anecdotes just from living on the ground in Colorado, because I think I'm the only person here that, you know, is, is from Colorado, so I think I can bring that experience. Um, if I may, I just want to show you all a picture on my phone. I just took this two weeks ago. I'm just going to read to it. I know, I'm watching. I'm watching the trip wires. So I just want you to see that. So it's a, it's a little dish of chocolates, looks very harmless. My two-year-old daughter, or two-and-a-half-year-old daughter, thought it looked very delicious. Um, this has the maximum serving of THC allowed in the state per square of that chocolate bar. And I don't know about you, but just looking at it, I wasn't able to tell that that was laced with marijuana. And do you want to know where that was? That was at a backpack store in downtown Denver. And my wife and daughter and I were looking at backpacks. And they were free samples. And as you saw, no signage, no warnings. Those are, if you look very carefully at the packaging of the bars on the back, you can see a little red THC. But you have to know what THC is. I was talking to uh, somebody in, in, in Illinois the other day, and they didn't know what THC was. So a lot of you folks don't even really know that this is laced with marijuana. So what's my point with that story, right? We write laws with the best of intentions. No one in Colorado wants you to no, you know, nobody, nobody who wrote the legislation thought, let's leave little loopholes here so people can actually target youth. You know, I don't think there's anybody that's a part of any legalized state that wants that. But best of intentions in these bills sometimes leads to the, you know, the worst outcomes. And we have to look at the states that have legalized marijuana, and I think Colorado provides a great example, to see how these legislation go. And Colorado has laws against advertising to youth. But chocolate bars look pretty appetizing. They have nice you know, neon green colors, yellow colors on these bars. I mean, very much colorful. Um, cookie Monster was used to market a marijuana-laced cookie um, in Denver just a couple months ago. We saw that. Um, so youth are still being targeted in, in states. And the reason for that is because the industry, if you've heard a lot about this commercialization, um, the industry has a profit motive to expand its user base. And what we're seeing is across all the legal states, they're targeting youth regardless of whether the laws say you can't or not. Um, the advertising uses Sesame Street characters. We're seeing gummy bears we try to ban them in Washington State, but they couldn't. They're certainly not banned anywhere else. Um, you know, we have these highly potent products that are in, you know, even as Kush Colas um, that we're seeing. And so that's kind of the experience, experience as a parent. I want to give you another anecdote. My friends who have kids that are a little older than my daughter, uh, you know, their kids go over to hang out at their friend's house. The question they have to ask their fellow parents of the kids that they go to hang out with is, are you storing these marijuana products safely? You know, are these, is there anything out that's accessible to the kids? And these are questions that you just don't really think about in a, in a pre-marijuana legalization environment, but you have to as a parent after you, you legalize. So I think it's important to note that. Another thing I want to talk about is, so, you know, that's kind of one aspect of the on-the-ground experience um, I think at the time. So the last thing I want to say is this, because I want to be respectful is we have Altria, Philip Morris, Marlboro, um, the biggest big tobacco company in the country is in for $4 billion in the marijuana industry. We have Purdue Pharma, their former CEO, who wrote the OxyContin playbook. He's the CEO of the marijuana company. Um, these are folks who stand to make a lot of money by targeting you, by doing a lot of other predatory tactics. So thank you for your time. It was, I think it was worth it for me to fly out here. I hope it was worth it for you all. <laughs> have a great day. Thank you for, for being thoughtful this time. Thank you. And um, we have others that are have been waiting a long time as well. Ben Agati, are you here? Yes. Good afternoon. My name is Benjamin Agati. I'm a senior assistant attorney general for the Department of Justice. I'm here to testify on behalf of Attorney General Warden McDonald. Um, I definitely will be less than three minutes. I'm happy to take your questions at any time. Thank you. Um, on behalf of the department, General McDonald and the rest of the department oppose. House Bill 44, 41, excuse me, we join the New Hampshire Department of Safety, also the New Hampshire Chiefs of Police Association, New Hampshire Academy of Family Physicians, and the Governor's Advisor on Addiction and Behavioral Health in opposition to this bill. More importantly, the Department of Justice is a partner with the Governor's Commission on Alcohol and Drug Abuse in opposing this bill. Now that commission is one that has approached this, all alcohol and all drug abuse, from a multidisciplinary approach. 
Law enforcement is only one very small component of that commission. They reviewed this at great lengths and concluded unanimously that this bill was the wrong one for New Hampshire. A lot has already been said. I'm not going to go back through those, but I only want to point out three very brief things. First, with regards to the fact that I am one of the attorneys that's hired to represent the state in certain criminal matters, um, I ask you to recall that marijuana is still illegal federally as a Schedule I drug. Going through the language of this bill, it brings with it all of the federal complications that the other 10 states in the District of Columbia have been unable to overcome. The United States Department of Justice can do what it likes, when it likes, when it comes to marijuana. When a representative from the ACLU was speaking, talked about the complications that come about from a marijuana conviction in regards to employment and housing. Those are all federal actions. This bill will not address those. This bill will not fix those. Second of all, um, from my years of experience working for three years in the drug unit and I've told you now 13 years to a homicide, this bill will not get rid of the illegal market. Um, I've spoken with my counterparts in California, Colorado, Maine, Massachusetts as well. It has not gotten rid of the illegal market there. What you've done is created a very high volume, high cash industry. And for the idea of trying to find the right tax rate and somehow that's going to help, the tax rate is in any sort of free market economy. If you have something that you can buy for no tax or something you can buy with a tax, you buy it with no tax. And so the illegal enterprise is still going to continue. It's an economic fallacy to think that legalization is going to drive out criminal elements with regards to this particular uh, considered to be an industry. And, and that, I'm not going to speak to the industry model, that's not my expertise. But as I'm sure you've seen, and I'm sure you've discussed in other settings, we've had this difference of opinion of what to do when it comes to drugs. And frequently, we look at it from a criminal justice model. And frequently, it's been determined that a criminal justice model by itself does not work. We need to look at it more from a public health model. If we're switching over in our criminal courts of looking at this as a public health model, then we should be listening to our public health entities out there. CDC, um, our medical societies, all the ones that you've heard from here today. If we're making that switch, then we should, if we're saying that we need to look at drugs as a public health model, then we should be listening to the public health agencies. And all of them are also in opposition. Thank you very much for your time and your great patience for allowing me to speak today. And thank you very much for being here. Um, I would, is uh, Dave Jubek or Jubek? He has to leave for another hearing. He will be back on May 7th. Okay. Daryl Abbas. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for take, taking my testimony today. My name is Daryl Abbas. I am a state representative out of Rockland County District 8, which is Salem, New Hampshire. I uh, also sit in the Criminal Justice Public Safety Committee. It's my uh, first term. Uh, I am on record, uh, actually counting my committee vote, I voted against this bill three different times. So I'm not going to get into repeating some of the reasons, a lot of the reasons were expressed to this committee. One of the uh, issues that I just came across with this was the black market controversy that we have here. Because there is an assumption that by creating a legitimate commercial industry, the black market will disappear. The black market where children buy the marijuana from. The black market is not subject to any of the regulations, at least they're not gonna follow any of the regulations created by, by the state. And the other issue is, is that a lot of the <coughs> individuals in New Hampshire that use recreational cannabis already have a place to purchase cannabis in the black market. So one of the thoughts that I always had was if you did create a commercial industry, you would have to have a competitive price with the black market, or consumers naturally will buy it for a lesser price. Not all, but many. I know right now in Massachusetts, uh, an ounce of marijuana, an ounce of cannabis is selling for anywhere between three fifty to four dollars per ounce, where the black market price, uh, depending on where you go, is between one fifty to two fifty, two hundred fifty dollars. So that's a concern that that uh, I thought that this bill really didn't address. So rather than repeat my testimony and what I said on the house floor, I decided to really think, what's the solution to that problem? And I thought about a lot of different 
ways to do it, but what really came to mind to me would be if, if cannabis was sold similar to the way that the state sells liquor, and I understand the Liquor Commission is not a huge fan of that theory, but it, we have the business model in place. If you did sell it in a retail store in that nature, you wouldn't have the overtaxation on the cannabis sale. The revenue paid to the state would be from the property and sale itself. Now, the research I did, if, if the state, which I can't believe I'm saying this before the Senate, but if, if the state were to purchase 500 pounds of cannabis which, and sell that equally throughout the different liquor stores, or whether it's a liquor store or it's a different entity or different store, but running a similar model, the price point per ounce, give or take, is around $65 to $75. And if that was sold at $200 out of the retail store, the revenue earned would be $125 to $135 an ounce, as opposed to what, under the original version, would be about $30 an ounce. I think under the sales tax or excise, whatever you want to call it, added on to it, it may be around $33 in taxes. So from a revenue perspective, that would actually be tremendously beneficial to the state, on top of maybe having a lower price that actually could compete with the black market. Just something that I figured if, if you did it that way, you also wouldn't have a cannabis shop in every other corner that will have a negative impact on real estate values. Uh, I know there's been much research with that. I do have, my family has a background in commercial real estate, so I have a good idea what some of the tenants want and don't want inside the shopping center. If you notice, if you look at some shopping centers, you'll see a, a pawn store next to an exotic video store. And there's a reason why a lot of those businesses migrate together. Well, but my understanding is a lot of the cannabis shops will fall into that. So that is a concern. You wouldn't have them in every corner if you sold them similar to liquor. So you wouldn't need to have more than one per, one store per town, especially maybe Manchester and Nashville would have a little different. But also, there's additional revenue that's being, that can be earned. Because if you go to the state liquor store, you can buy margarita salt or whatever it is. You can sell accessories as well. So my thought was, from a revenue perspective, this would be the best way to actually maximize the revenue. Just ask that be seriously considered. Otherwise, the black market will continue to flourish. It actually operates, um, it's easier for the black market to operate when it's commercialized and decriminalized because they don't have to actually hide their efforts as much as they do. Thank you. I'll take any questions. And I did do research on one last section. One, that's the best part. I, the research I did, 40 to 50% of our liquor sales go to out-of-state consumers. Most of the time, they buy in bulk and the price is way better. Well, the fiscal note in HB 41 estimates about less than 1% would go to out-of-state consumers. So that three to four times the revenue, if you were actually able to get your sales consistent with, with labor sales, you actually could come close to what I thought would around the $200 million range, as opposed to 30 dollars Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll take any questions. Thank you. 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 Um, 
this school principal was sharing his concern that our, their, his middle schoolers, his eighth graders, seventh graders, are watching what legislation is doing. They are watching what is being passed. They are having these conversations. Um, and they are very confused. They believe that marijuana is already legalized because the House has passed it. They're not uh, really educated. And a lot of adults are not educated in the process of legislation. Um, so we have to field their questions, and um, it's always very, very confusing and hard for them to understand. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about um, the poly drug use. Um, kids are not just using marijuana, they are also combining with alcohol, um, over-the-counter medicine, and prescription drugs. Um, and that is extremely dangerous and can have harmful interactions. Um, and as we've heard today, THC levels are through the roof right now, um, and we are seeing scientifically engineered strains that are the, the purpose, the sole purpose is to get someone intoxicated. Um, and HB um, 481 has no restrictions on THC levels. Um, another concern is the delivery method of THC. We all know that the problems that we're having with Juul, um, there will be other methods that will be coming down the pike. Um, and you have heard today that those, the THC oil is being, being introduced into these, um, these methods. Um, and of course, middle schoolers, fifth graders, are being introduced to this method of use. Also, quality of life comes into question. Um, quality of life for non-users. I am smelling it on a daily basis now that it is nice. I, live in a I work in a college town. I live in rural New Hampshire. Um, and I have to shut my windows in my neighborhood during the summer because I cannot stand the smell. Um, and now the, the, this House Bill 481 um, is, it has no restriction on advertising either, and that's scary too. Um, I also want to quickly read the testimony by the Restorative Justice Youth. Um, he wrote, as a youth when I was first exposed to marijuana, I was always told the same two things. It was harmless and just a plant that comes from the earth. I found that it was very easy to accept these facts, especially when many people you were around are involved with this drug. When marijuana was decriminalized, it made it seem less harmful. And I, I'm sorry, but did you hand that out? I you? did. Would you mind if we just read it? So oh, that's that totally fine. Yeah, years. so he did say he did not want it, and he, is a, he was a 17-year-old when he wrote this. Thank you very much. Uh, I Um, Kristen Johnson, are you here? Yes. Don't worry, I talk really fast. <laughs> Good hobbies for you. My name is Dr. Kristen Johnson. I'm a pediatrician. I live in New Fields and practice in Exeter. Uh, and I'm here today as, uh, as a physician, as a pediatrician as a member of the New Hampshire uh, American Academy of Pediatrics chapter, as a member of the New Hampshire Medical Society, and as a parent of two young children. I'm here in opposition of House Bill 481. We've seen in states and we've heard today about uh, the increasing levels, the significant impact, <coughs> excuse me, on the health and safety uh, in children with recreational uh, and commercialized marijuana has been put in place. We've seen increases in motor vehicle fatalities and injuries. We've seen those increases in calls to poison centers, visits in the emergency room, and accidental overdoses. And we see those here in New Hampshire, but not in the numbers that we see in these communities where they have, uh, in these states where they have authorized uh, recreational use. And we talked about um, these accidental ingestions. We, you know, we're gonna put our edibles away from our children, yet I just put away our Easter candy uh, in a location that my kids aren't supposed to get. They're getting it. And how are they going to know the difference <laughs> when they're at a friend's house? What that stash is in the top shelf of the cabinet? Uh, how are they going to differentiate that? And we heard earlier today some evidence about that. Uh, as we look at the commercialization of marijuana in other states, we see the rising rates of youth use, even though this is not allowed by the legislation. And as we heard earlier, the businesses that are taking over this commercialization 
um, are the same ones that were part of the tobacco uh, industry early on. And we're seeing that their advertisements are targeted to youth. And in fact, some of the uh, advertisements are the same ones we saw years, decades ago. They just changed the name from their tobacco products to their marijuana products. So as we look at these uh, legislations that are being put forward, I really encourage you to look at some of that scientific data. I provided some just really basic graphs um, looking at some of the things we've heard today about changes in full-scale IQ, about risk of schizophrenia and other mental illnesses. Uh, these are the ones I use in my office when I talk to my patients and I show them so that they can have good understanding of education. Uh, can we look at some of the information we have about the developing brain? We know the frontal lobe particularly isn't fully developed until their kids are 26, kids, young adults are 26. Can we look at that as we're looking at regulation? And can we look at regulation and taxation uh, with regard to what these outcomes are for our youth? If our youth rates rise, can there be a consequence to any industry that might be taking uh, part in this uh, in our state. If we have rising rates of youth use, uh, there should be, in my opinion, uh, some adequate uh, increase in restriction. So I want to end with a quick creation story. I care for a teenage boy. He's a varsity athlete. He's a popular guy. He's got a bunch of friends. He's a really great kid. He sees me regularly in the office as well as a drug and alcohol counselor as he works to uh, get rid of his nicotine addiction as well as his marijuana addiction and improve his mental health. But what brought him to tears in my office the other day was him being concerned about what to say to his friends, what to do to help impact them because they are heading down the same path he was. He's got a supportive family who brings him in regularly, but this is a problem that's happening for all of our, our kids, those in supportive environments and those with risk factors. So please consider the health and safety of our youth as you consider the future of cannabis legislation here in New Hampshire. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Questions? Thank you for taking the time. Is Brian Phillips. Dr. Stewart. Good afternoon, Senators. Thank you for having me here. Uh, I'll pass these out at the end. Uh, I have one copy of each, and I apologize if I get to speak. Um, I'm Dr. Stuart Glassman. I'm a specialist in physical medicine and rehabilitation here at Concord. Uh, I, I'm going to speak on behalf of the New Hampshire Medical Society. Uh, I represent the New Hampshire Medical Society on two commissions in the state. The first is the Therapeutic Cannabis Advisory Council since 2013. The second was the Governor's Commission looking at the issue of marijuana legalization, of which that report is the basis for this bill. Uh, the report is kind of like the Mueller report because we couldn't come out with a recommendation one way or the other. But we gave a roadmap of how to get somewhere if that was the will of uh, the legislature. It's important to realize that the eight states that currently have legalized marijuana, it was a voter referendum. It was not based upon legislative decision making or voting. So keep that in mind. Uh, you've heard about the issues of concerns of public health risks, uh, motor vehicle crashes, increasing the states where it's um, pediatric emergency room visits, uh, cannabis use disorder. Um, so uh, you've heard that uh, over and over here. Um, it's important to realize that we don't have the scientific data about marijuana in 2019 what effects it uh, causes. This is not your grandfather's marijuana. This is not your mother's marijuana from 20 or 40 years ago. Um, sitting through the 26 meetings that happened for the commission over the past year, and the eight states that testified and gave us their insight, I will tell you that none of the people who spoke to us said that what they thought the program would end up being like was what ended up being like. The black market did not go down. The revenue for the taxation and uh, uh, into their state revenue was about 1% of the budget. It wasn't the windfall that they were hoping for. Uh, there were many public health issues, and there was no funding for those consequences of public health issues. Um, so if you look at the other states, and we heard them over and over the course of a year, um, legalizing marijuana comes with many risks, which you've heard and not a lot of windfall benefit for the state. We already have a medical program in place. We already have decriminalization. So 
the question is, what is this bill going to add that we don't have already? Free use, criminal justice issues, certainly that's relevant, not for me to speak on uh, as well. Um, and one thing you may not have heard of at this point is that in 2017, the President uh, of the United States formed a commission to look at combating drug addiction and opioid uh, abuse. One of their recommendations in their report from November 2017 was that trying to use marijuana to solve an opioid crisis in the midst of an opioid epidemic could not be supported and was probably a very bad idea um, because of the fact that studies have actually shown that opioid use disorder actually goes up long term with marijuana use. So there are a lot of things here that are a problem. There's not the ability to do the research because it's schedule one. Um, and because the health effects cannot be shown to be more beneficial than the risk involved, um, the medical side cannot support HB4 anymore. So I'll leave this information for you and available for any questions. Amen. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you very much. My name is Michael King, from resident of New Hampshire, uh, work in Massachusetts. So I want to just give you a quick testimony of what's going on in Massachusetts. That's new, right? You haven't really heard that this morning, or this afternoon. Um, in, in Massachusetts, there was a referendum. Uh, 5446 was how about it, it turned out. 54% um, being for marijuana in the referendum in 2016. Um, compared to Colorado, you were um, you had to opt in. Okay, after the referendum in Colorado, in, in Massachusetts, the industry got smart and you had to opt out. Okay, so 54% of the voters in Massachusetts said yes to pro, to legalization, um, but not all those towns, there were 91 towns and cities that didn't want to be a part of it. Okay, so now two years later, what's happened, a lot of people are saying that the rollout in Massachusetts has been so slow. And the reason is because 250 out of the 351 towns and cities have either opted out or passed a moratorium regarding commercial marijuana. So we can see that 71%, after they really understood what commercial marijuana was, because many of them thought it was medical in 2016, um, when they figured it out, 71% said no. And I would imagine the same would be true in New Hampshire. Another thing I want to point out with regard to the bill that I had concerns about, because I was at, at the previous hearing uh, with Representative Cushing. Two, two points that I had an issue with that I asked him about, and he actually confirmed that my concerns were true. One was uh, in talking about this opt-out for towns and cities in New Hampshire. Um, and it says in the bill, as I understand it, that at the time of application to the CCC is when that town or city needs to opt out. So I would be concerned about who is being the Paul Revere to these towns and cities saying, okay, applications are coming in, you need to know about the opt-out process, because I'll tell you, the opt-out process is not easy. Um, and I'll tell you about the opt-out process. There's a general bylaw and a zoning bylaw. A lot, so uh, let me give you an example of Brewster, Massachusetts. Brewster, Massachusetts passed a zoning bylaw that would zone a uh, pot shop to a certain part of town, right? Uh, and then eventually they wanted to just opt out altogether, so they passed a general bylaw. But they were found that the general bylaw did not supersede the zoning bylaw. The zoning bylaw superseded the, the general bylaw. And now there's all this confusion about do we pass a general bylaw, do we pass a zoning bylaw? And as you know, I don't know if it's the same in New Hampshire, but a zoning bylaw takes two thirds and a general takes 50% uh, plus one. So those are my two main points in regard to just the ins and outs of the opt out. Just understand that in Massachusetts, it's a very confusing process. Um, and the same would happen in New Hampshire. And the timing, who's going to tell towns and cities in New Hampshire that the CCC is getting these applications? Probably nobody, right? And then I also asked on the CCC in New Hampshire, I know 15 seconds ago. On the CCC in New Hampshire, I asked uh, Representative Cushing, so only pro-legalization people can be on the CCC, you know? And, and he confirmed that that's true. Only pro-legalization people can be on the CCC. So it's corporate capture, right? Of, of, is there diversity of thought on the CCC? Uh, and then for just 10 seconds, I'm just going to point out, I did put in here the opioid and cannabis use among adults and chronic pain. This is a December 13, 2018 article uh, from the 
uh, Journal of Addiction Medicine. The results said, suggest that compared to opioid use alone, opioid and, opioid and cannabis co-use was associated with elevated anxiety and depression symptoms as well as tobacco, alcohol, cocaine, and sedative use problems, but not pain experience. So this is a very recent study that's showing that cannabis, marijuana, is actually increasing the use of other drugs uh, and not helping with the pain addiction when dealing with opioids. Thank you so much. Any questions? Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and good afternoon. Um, are you aware of an individual named Bud Court? No. Um, okay. Uh, he is an individual who speaks against um, legalization, but more from a commercialized um, process. Right. Yeah. A point, um, he doesn't pass moral judgment on people who decide they want to do this. But he really wants people to be aware of the commercialization. And he did a wonderful TED Talk, um, I believe about a week and a half ago. He mm. uh, lives in Colorado, he's a Colorado native. Um, and he talks about the hazards of commercialization yeah. and the problems that they're having mm. um, and that they're seeing in Colorado that many people just are not talking about. Yeah. So I just didn't know if you were aware of him. He's also written a book called Weed Inc. Mm. Um, and it's all about commercialization yeah. and how it's really not a very good thing. Yeah, I mean, we see the same, the same, loop, the same blueprint of the uh, tobacco industry, right? It started medical. Um, and then went to commercial eventually, you know, we're, and decriminalization is the same process that we're seeing in all these states. So, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I believe that we have concluded the people who have said that they will. Well, Chair, I, I left the room because you were. Oh, yes. Advised me that this was going to be closed and reconvened in, in a couple of weeks. And yeah. Then yeah. Through, so. We are still yeah. reconvening on We are still reconvening. I'm going to speak now. Mm -hmm. on more than, uh, Okay, go ahead. We're going to give you exactly. That's all right with you. Sure, sure. Just, it, it's been a very long day. And sure, I understand. What I have to talk about is not going to repeat anything you have heard. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. For the record, I am Representative Steve Pearson of Rockingham District 6. But I'm going to speak to you today not, as, not in that role, but in my other role. Uh, when I'm not at the legislature, I run one of Manchester's safe stations. I work, I'm a lieutenant with the Manchester Fire Department, so every fourth day I'm responsible for the safe station on South Main Street. Uh, I want to correct something real quick, two quick things that Representative uh, Cushing said. They, you get a lot of testimony about reefer madness and how that supposedly tied into marijuana becoming illegal in, in the United States, and that is a fallacy. Texas, 1919, California, 1913, Oregon, 1923, Washington, Nevada, both 23, Utah, 1915, Montana, 1929. It's not 1937. Reefer Madness did not cause states to make marijuana illegal. That had been done decades before. The second thing I want to address is very specifically in the bill. On page 19, line 19, it specifically talks about appropriation. And Representative Cushing mentioned that the program will pay for itself in this bill. So I'm going to give you some math. And I have worked um, extensively with Representative O'Brien here after post-commission. On page 19, line 19, it earmarks, and I'll read it, 5% to public safety agencies, including police, fire, rescue, and the hiring and training of additional drug recognition experts for advanced roadside impairment. 5%. Well, what is 5%? If you look at the commission that the state put forward, they based their revenue at the time of the commission at $5,500 a pound, okay, for marijuana. It is 10% of that now, because the West Coast has a 2 million pound surplus in Oregon alone. So the price is not at $5,500 a pound as it was when the commission was founded two years ago. So what that basically does well, and I'll even grant them the $5,500 a pound. If you look at the projections of revenue under the Marijuana Commission, that's 19 to $28 million roughly for the state. This is based on a market price that no longer holds true. And this is before all of operating costs, as Representative Obrami mentioned, are taken off the top first. Assuming that the state actually made the projection range, 5% of that earmark for law enforcement, EMS, and fire, that equals $650,000 that's earmarked. We have 234 cities and towns in New Hampshire. 
That's $2,700 a town if it's distributed equally. I can tell you right now that Manchester Natural are going to push for more than $2,700. That, that, that doesn't even fund two cops on overtime for one weekend. So the idea that this bill is going to fund the things that the downsides of this are completely insane. The math isn't there. And that's with the $5,500 a pound from two years ago. You get an actual realistic market rate since we've now changed this bill to a sales based revenue rather than the growing revenue. And it, it's just not there. So that's something that I hope the Senate really takes into consideration here is that what's earmarked for law enforcement, fire, and EMS is, is in essence zero. It's in essence zero for us. And uh, Mr. Lima? Lima, yes. Lima. Timothy Lima. Thank you, Madam Chairman. And thank you all for your participation today. A lot of testimony. <clears throat> Again, my name is, for the record, my name is Timothy Lima. I am uh, 30 years working with. Uh, public schools as a social worker doing student assistance programs. Um, I am currently the chair of the Governor's Commission on Alcohol and Drug uh, Prevention Task Force. And I'm here on behalf of the, the Governor's Commission to, um, to state that the Governor's Commission has voted uh, and in opposition of this bill, uh, primarily for the provisions that it does not look out for, for our youth and the public safety of our youth. Um, and <clears throat> uh, one of the, also the, the strategic plan for the next three years for the Governor's Commission has been um, around looking at reduction of youth use of marijuana. We've been seeing a steady incline of use of, of, of our youth uh, around marijuana recently, especially with the passage of the therapeutic cannabis law, because this our students' perception is, well, if it's being used as medicine, it's really not harmful. And so that we're, we're seeing that, that lack of perception of harm and a steady increase. So part of the commission's goal has been to try and decrease that, that use. Um, so it's uh, by, by 10% in, in the next three years is our goal. Um, I'd like to give you just a couple of a lot of the, the things that we talked that have been talked about today, but I did want to give a couple of personal anecdotes to reemphasize. Um, <coughs> obviously, we've heard that the um, mar big marijuana, as big alcohol and big tobacco, benefit from having people who are absent uh, create addicts because eighty percent of the product is consumed by like ten percent of the population, less than ten percent of the population. Um, so the targeting of youth has absolutely been part of that strategy in, in all of those industries. <clears throat> to give you an example, um, students have shared with me their Instagrams of um, marijuana dabbing devices, which is the 90% dab pens, 95% uh, uh, THC oil, uh, that is marketed in a SpongeBob square pants, bikini bottom, um, uh, pineapple flavored dab oil, okay? And so clearly, you know, that, that's targeting our youth. Um, the other, the other uh, Instagram they shared with me was uh, Willy Wonka chocolate bars, you know, and again, 90% THC. Um, so clearly the, the industry knows that our youth are vulnerable to the addiction and um, that, that this really places our youth at significant risk. Um, the other piece that, that we're seeing in our state currently, that I just anecdotally want to share, sorry, um, is about the current enforcement issues around the gray area where it's being de it has been decriminalized for adults but not for youth. There are no resources to intervene really with our youth, like through juvenile justice or whatever, because um, the state labs are not testing. The, at least the law enforcement and JPBOs are telling me the state labs are not testing these products because they're so overwhelmed with the opioid epidemic. So, uh, so enforcement in terms of even intervening and getting these kids into proper screening and referral programs is, is impacted. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your testimony. Seeing no questions. 
But we now. <laughs> Are you going to come back? Okay. okay. Thank you very much. I'd like to close this hearing. I mean, not close it. Take it that back. And we're going to recess this hearing until 9 a.m. May 7th. Oh, sorry, for long. <laughs> oh.